All right, welcome everybody. We're here with our second podcast for the Oris podcast, and tonight we're going to be talking about player retention and the fun of DVDs. This will include the mechanics of the game, what people find fun in this game, even though that's very subjective, and uh, a few other topics as well that our guests will be uh, free to bring up as well. With that being said, tonight we have Trickster Shadow, Card Clasher, uh, SKT, QT, Super Aero Nova, Squid Savage, and Posh. So, for me, I'm Vampire Score Toothy, I'm a killer main, and I've played this game for 3,600 hours. And for the most part, I used to be a pretty mixed player, but nowadays I primarily play Killer, where I mostly play Oni, sometimes Nurse, Demogorgon, Hillbilly, Huntress, and you know, a few others as well. But I'm going to stop rambling on, and we'll start off with Trickster. Trickster, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So I'm Trickster Shadow. I'm a variety killer main with over 6,000 hours in DVD. I primarily do killer requests on my stream, to where I just play whatever build or whatever killer people want me to play. And I started playing in 2016, uh, but didn't start like hardcore playing until 2018. I used to be a Billy main for about 2,000 hours, but now I'm super washed with Billy. Uh, <laughs> now I just play everybody. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, and Card Clasher, would you like to introduce yourself? I guess I can. So, I basically started this game around 2017, around January. So basically at the start of 2017. And I've only liked playing Killer ever. Survivor, I just find extremely boring unless I'm with friends. All right, and how about... I also play the game competitively, which is meh. That's it, I guess. All right, and SKT, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm <clears throat> SKTQT, aka Serena. You probably see me either in game, Twitter, blah blah blah. Uh, I mostly play Survivor, but I do also play a lot of Spirit because <laughs> <laughs> that's the only killer I have fun on. And yes, I have very expensive headphones. That's pretty much all I'm known for. All right. Use the equalizer, though. <laughs> Sometimes. <coughs> uh, test, test. Every now and can then. You, like, can you move my profile picture like away from her or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, sure. Wow. Goodbye. Um. All right. Feel so attacked right now. Aaron, would you like to introduce <laughs> yourself? Uh, sure. Um. Hi, my name's Aaron. Uh, I've been playing the game since like 2018, around when Clown released. I have about 3k hours in the game. Mainly play Survivor. I uh, play Killer every now and then, mainly Huntress. Um, but I'm familiar with both sides. And I also play competitive DVD. Nice. And Squid, would you like to introduce, uh, introduce yourself? Yep. Uh, my name's Squid. I'm a Survivor main. I have like 4,000 hours. I started playing around the end of 2018 when Legion could stab you three times. Um, so there were a lot of DCs when I first started. Um, I, I don't play killer much, but when I do, it's usually when survivor queues are pretty slow. Um, I'm familiar with both, and I also play comp too. All right. And Posh, how about you? Hi. Uh, I'm Poshums. You can call me Posh. I'm a survivor main. Um, and yeah, I've been playing this game for about 1,500 hours. Mostly play Survivor, pretty much exclusively play Survivor. <laughs> Alright, everyone did go on that, so we'll get, started with, we'll get started with our first topic for tonight. So, the first thing I want to talk about is, recently there was actually a uh, player dip, which actually uh, encouraged me to come up with this topic, which is about player retention. So, by this I mean... There's a, there's a couple of things that will keep players coming into the game time and time again. And, well, recently, we actually saw the biggest dip uh, in the history of uh, DBD, where I think it dropped down by 22% for like a uh, short period of time. Now, luckily, the game did bounce back from that, but I guess that'll be like the first thing that we'll be talking about as far as the player retention topic goes. And I kind of want to dive into what you guys might think could have caused it. I mean, honestly, I think it's just the Ruin and Dying meta. I I, uh, I think the Ruin and Dying meta is honestly really unhealthy for the game. And if they don't do anything about it, it's probably going to keep on hurting the game. Because Ruin and Dying, 
like it's a really strong build and like it can be countered but a majority of people that play this game are very casual and so it's just going to be like curb stomp after curb stomp if somebody runs ruin and dying and so until they resolve that it's just going to be like oh you go into a game because i think the devs release stats saying that in like red ranks uh, it's like a 68 percent kill rate on average for uh, for killers and that's on average so if you're just slightly better then you're going to be 4k pretty easily and so until they resolve that and make it to where ruin and dying isn't as oppressive, you're probably going to keep on seeing a negative trend. Yeah, I think I don't I don't know how exactly they would nerf it, though. Like, would they just without like actually killing the perk? Like, I think like it would be healthy for you know killers to have other perks to run. But like, what would they do with the undying part? Would they make it to where it only respawns once or? So I actually had an idea for that. And my idea I actually brought it up in the previous podcast where. The way it would work is Undying would still be allowed to it would be allowed to revive your totems, but the way that would work is that instead of it working until you run out of doles, it would be one respawn per hex totem. So think of it this way, right? So say that you're running Ruin, then it would respawn once. But say that you're also running Retribution. So if someone broke Ruin, you would still have the ability to allow uh, Retribution to respawn in at least one time. And so the idea is that you can have that powerful build, but you need to run more hex totems in order to get more respawns. So that way, when you do lose your build, you have nothing else. Like, it'll actually be, go back to being a risk for reward. And that was my idea. That'd be interesting. I think one of the biggest problems with Ruin Undying is <clears throat> there's zero interaction that the killer has to do to get benefit out of it. Like, the killer can just do whatever they want, and the survivors usually have to cleanse like three, four totems before, you know, it's out of the game. So like maybe if the killer had to get a hook or two hooks or something for it to then transfer to another totem, maybe that would be a better, healthier alternative. You could also just get so much pressure if you figure out which totem is your undying, like you use protect undying and they can cleanse every other totem and waste their time. And you basically just win from that too, which is super boring. Not only that, but there's also some really nasty synergies that came in with the mid-chapter. So, for instance, the Natophobia now works on totem cleansing speed. And, you know, you pair that up with uh, Thrill of the Hunt, and you end up with this issue where totems will actually take 25 seconds to cleanse when, you at, when you're at full power with both of them. And realistically speaking, survivors are not going to want to heal when Ruin is in effect, because that's free regression. And so, you essentially have this scenario where... If you're anywhere on the map, you can make it to the totem, unless the survivor is like getting body blocked by somebody else. And the other thing is that they actually changed Surge for the wrong reasons in the mid-chapter as well. So an example of this is that they changed the mechanics behind Surge where instead of it instead of it being where it only applies on non-regressing generators, it now applies to generators that are actively regressing. And so you actually lost like two good parts of the perk, which is the fact that you know you could always have it work on only the generators that are not being worked on. Which, I mean, sorry, only the generators that are being worked on, because that would give you tracking to a very limited extent, because you would know if someone is in the area or not if they tap the generator, and you can kind of base it off the amount of points that you earned. And the other thing about it is that you would always have it available for whenever you're made to another area of the map. So because of that change. They made it really annoying because it works with Ruin now, even if the generator is already regressing. And the other thing about it is that now they did that instead of allowing it to apply on M2 downs, so you know, powered hits. So you know, it felt like a perk that they changed for the wrong reasons, and then they also made it more annoying when paired with a combo that people already don't like. So I'm kind of wondering, do you guys think that, like, the problem with, like, the Ruin and Dying meta is, isn't even Ruin and Dying itself, but when it's combined with Tinker? Or how do you guys I, feel I, about that? I think, I think Tinker. I think a bit, be, yeah. I think that makes it a little bit better. Yeah. Especially with a high mobility killer. Like, if you had, like, mm. Light, Nurse, things like that. Really. Yeah, I was kind of feeling like Tinker should be adjusted to where it can only activate once uh per gen so like if it uh, if like a gen that you're working on activates with tinker for the killer like it can't activate tinker anymore i think because you tweeted that i agree with 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think it just it gets to like a really boring place to where the killer keeps on dropping Jason, going back to the gen, and it regresses down below seventy five, and then like you got to go back, and it goes to seventy five again. They come back again, and it leads to like thirty minute games where like nothing's happening, and the game's just super slowed down. Yeah, even as someone who likes to run, uh, because I don't like to run uh, Rune Undying. What I do instead is I like to run Surge and uh, Tinkerer. I can actually agree with that. Where I notice that a lot of times. I actually like to return to the generators in order to make sure I can regress them with Surge in order to get constant value out of the perk. Now I will say though, uh, would this apply to just the undetectable effect, or would it also apply to the noise notification? Because I feel like, you know, even just getting a notification is pretty useful, and I like the perk for that, personally. I think it would have to be both. Hmm. I feel. Because then, like, I feel like if, if you just, if say that you move one or the other, um, I mean, you can, they can still just go back to the gen. Yeah, you'll have time to get off of it, but it's still the same problem that we're already having. Um, and then if you get rid of the uh, the the noise notification, they still get like um their Terry to sit in, and I feel like that wouldn't even really help the killer. Maybe like in chase or whatever, but and like a good killer could also just assume what which gen has most progress easily, so it wouldn't even really matter. Yeah, yeah. They say, oh, my Terry is gone, so I can just go back to the gen that I just last checked on. Now, my one question for this, though, is do we think that Tinkerer is a problem by itself, though, or is it really only a problem because of Ruin Undying being paired with it? Probably the synergy. The synergy, definitely. Yeah. Mm. I don't think it's a super strong perk. So in that yeah. case, would it be reasonable to nerf the perk because of the, uh, because of the synergy, or should we uh, look into the fact that perhaps there are certain perks that just get too uh, pushed too far when you pair them up? Because if you think of it this way, this also exists with other perk combos in this game, which I feel like most of us are probably very familiar with. Like Unbreakable DS? Not just that, but you know, Unbreakable that DS and you pair it up with like Soul Guard and then uh, maybe Deliverance or something to really yeah. rub it in. Just know no matter what, I'm getting up. Yeah, like <laughs> fuck this, I'm going home. Yeah. I mean, I think DBD for a while has been going towards this like cliff and we been noticing a lot more especially with ruin and dying where because they refuse to address perks energy and instead they just address perks individually it kind of hurts the game because when you address them individually instead of like factoring in all the perks together like how they work together then you're kind of having to do like heavy-handed moves of just like nerfing a perk that may not like be good by itself but because it synergizes so well with other things then you gotta nerf it because there's no other systems in place that's why i think they need to like some other games I've done it to where if there's like a really strong perk it'll be weighted to where if you're going to run that really strong perk then you won't have as much available in your build to run like other strong perks so like say if you ran like Ruin and Dying then you would be forced to run like two kind of like meh perks instead and you can't run like really good perks alongside that so they need to implement some system like that in order to make it to where they can still can release good perks but they're not like super oppressive along with everything else in the game so like non stackable and stuff and it's like oh yeah yeah i get, I get what you mean, what you mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. so like if you want to run ruin and dying you can run ruin and dying it's just since that's so strong together you got to run like monstrous shrine with it or like that's the only perks that you can like really run just like really <laughs> shit perks <laughs> so kind of like you. call of duty kind of loadout kind Sorry. of thing right? yeah yeah that would make more yeah. sense or like if you get limited how many gen perks you can run in a single build and then, you know, the other two perks, they have to be, like, chase perks or barbecue or something like that. Reddit yeah. is going insane right now. <laughs> but, Wait, I what? mean, like, because we already have, like, rarities. <laughs> we already have, like, perk rarities where you could, like, assign, like, like yellow perks. Like, you could, they would have to go through all the perks and, like, de- determine, like, the rarities of each of them, how good they are. But you could, like, assign, like, oh, yellow perks are, like, worth one point and then, like, purple perks are worth three points. And then you can only have, like, ten points in your entire build. And so you gotta like try to figure out like what synergizes with what without going over the max. Well, I mean, like, if if we went that way, then object would only be worth one point according to the Des, right? Okay, yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have one question though from this idea, which I like the idea so far, but can we trust behavior to make the right decision to know which perks are good and which perks are bad? No. Probably not. No. Probably not. No. <laughs> 
And like that annoys me because isn't that what the Fog Whisper program is supposed to be about? I feel like they do nothing with that besides just like glorified <laughs> promotion. Yeah. They need to take more feedback from us. At least at least people who like play the game a lot. It's like there should be like an hour requirement and like a certain kind of like knowledge with it, you know? Just don't ask anybody. But I agree, they should use the fog whispers more to get more insight on it. From what I've heard, they actually used to have a uh, Discord to uh, talk about upcoming changes, but I think that one fell apart after a while, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, their focus group? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not really sure what the full story was, so I'm not going to really judge it in, like, you know, in its entirety, but I think it happened around the time when after Pyramid had got released. Oh, well, that's why he came out like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have quit it too. <laughs> so is there anything else that we think might be affecting the player retention if not then what are some things that you guys think allow players to come back to this game time and time again mm -hmm. i feel like well personally just the way the killers have been going on release so like you have the most recent is like death slinger and pyramid head back to back like for survivor if you're a survivor player they're pretty much taking away everything you have against a killer, which would be windows and pallets and stuff like that. So I find that very boring to repeatedly play against, even though I keep doing it. Yeah. That'd be one reason um, I people like... would leave. Kind of like Nurse, but with no learning curve. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I yeah. feel like a lot of the killers recently released now just have like no, like you don't have to learn anything about them. You can just kind of pick them up and then just play them well. And the even if they... Yeah. And even for the ones that you do uh, have to learn, I feel like their uh, learning curve is actually lower than that of the older killers. So, for instance, I think a great example of this is Oni versus Hillbilly, where Hillbilly has a great skill cap to him because you have to learn how to curve around pallets with your chainsaw. Whereas Oni, you have some things you need to learn, like positioning and, you know, how to get your power fast and all that. Like, he has little neat things that you can learn about him and you can learn how to be more efficient with him, but he doesn't quite have the skill cap that Hillbilly has. So he ends up being like an easier version that can also be more oppressive, especially yeah, with add-ons. Oni just yeah. hits you around corners anyway, so that's pretty fun. Oh. I had Oni swing behind him, <laughs> and I still went down today. Dude, yeah. I went. I got hit through a tree. It was crazy. People I wonder why I don't like Oni. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's always like, "Why don't you like Oni posture?" I'm like, "Cause I get hit through shit all the time." That's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think uh, kind of tying everything together, people don't like. We're not. People aren't staying playing this game because the current meta is just so goddamn boring. Like, it's just the same shit on both sides. Like, there's tons of survivors out there running things that aren't fun to go against as killer. Like, DS, Unbreakable, Soul Guard, Dead Heart. Those are not fun perks to go against. And then killers are running Ruin, Undying. And it's like, if you're seeing the same stuff over and over again, you really have no reason to keep playing this game. It's the same shit. I'm curious to what you guys think, but like, I don't know if I just maybe not noticed it before, or I'm just noticing it more now, but like right after best of the best, I feel like killers just started playing differently, like to more emulate like what was going on in that big tournament. I'm not going to lie, I've not paid attention to that to know. <laughs> well, I just, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I've noticed a lot more of the same kind of builds like that. And obviously with the Ruin and Dying Tinker meta, but like also killers are playing, like I got to get a three gen. I got a tunnel one survivor out. I got to camp this hook in the second state. And it's just a lot of the, the stuff that they people do in tournaments and stuff. I'm noticing more now just in a public lobby. I think yeah. the reason as to why would be because... So if you think of it this way, people want to replicate what they see good players do. So as an example, when it comes to uh, killers, a lot of people look up to content creators to figure out what their player style should be, what their perks should be, because that's how they learn and play a catch-up game. And I know for me, when I first got started up in this game, that's what I did uh, back in like 2017, where I wanted to play catch-up game, I wanted to know what was good in the game, I wanted to know which killers were good in the game, and then I eventually threw away all that advice, but... That's fair. When it, came to, uh, when it comes to that, I think BOTB, it featured a lot of content creators, and it was also probably the biggest tournament that DVD has ever had, so... I think that those builds ended up getting a lot of exposure. So to me, it makes a lot of sense that those builds became more common. Yeah. I the was just curious if I noticed the, um... it. Go ahead. Oh, 
uh, the day after BOTB, I, there was actually a killer that was running Corrupt, Ruin, Pop, and Noet, and I, I rolled my eyes so hard. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Gotta go for that 4K. Yeah, how else are they supposed to win? So I kind of have a question for those of you guys that play a lot of Survivor. Do you think the most annoying part is the like the way that the, the killers are playing and like the builds that they're using, or the queue times that you have to experience like after you experience those like unfun builds or unfun play styles? <laughs> for compound. me personally, yeah, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I was just saying I think they compound. Pretty much, like the worst thing is when you wait five minutes for a game just to go against like a Ebony Mori spirit. Get tunnel off first hook, then you're back in the queue for another five minutes, hoping that the next killer is not the same one or like the same way. I think they really amplify each other. I I don't have. Well, I know you are. uh, What is everybody else? What region? East, west, central? I'm east. East. Okay. Because like on west, I don't really experience too bad of queues. Like, and I, you know, I'm usually playing around 4 p.m. PST to, you know, sometimes 8 p.m. or later, but I don't really have that bad of cues on my side so i feel like for me it's more of the the play style and the builds that for me I, for me i got a uh, queue times down to a science where i pretty much just paid attention to what time survivor cues were good uh from and until and i did the same thing with killers so the one thing i found is that if i want to play survivor i have to get on before 6 p.m otherwise killer cues get better over time from there on out until about like 4 a.m but the one thing I've noticed that from when I've played Survivor, which, again, I used to be a pretty mixed player, but there are some killers that I just really despise going against. And the one thing I've noticed is that if you get one bad game and you can instantly queue up and go into another one, then it kind of makes up for it a little bit, unless yeah. you get that other unfun match directly afterwards. So, like, I can speak more so from when I play Killer where. You know, let's say I get, like, you know, a really boring map like Mother's Dwelling or Midwitch because they're, like, my least favorite maps in the game. And, you know, if I play Killer and I'm at a time, like, you know, I'm playing at a time where the queues are good, I can just immediately queue up and then be good to go. And I'll just forget about it after the next game. But, you know, you wait 5, 10, hell, depending on the time, even 15 minutes, then it becomes even worse. Because yeah. now you're having that unfun match and now that thought of the unfun match is staying in your head, and now you're stuck with it until you get the next game. And then when that's unfun, it adds on to that, and you have that same thought, except now you're thinking about both games. So it's like, man, those two games are incredibly unfun. I don't want to deal with this anymore. And then that's where most people just kind of pop off. Yeah. yeah Did you guys see uh, Otofu's suggestion for fixing the queue times? I am not. I did. No. Quick play. Uh, so, yeah, the quick play. So when DBD first launched, they got rid of it a few months into DBD. But when DBD first launched, they had a quick play option to where if there was like not enough survivors, you press quick play and it would throw you into survivor queue. And like same thing for killer, vice versa. And I was wondering if, because he suggested it, I was wondering if like that got added back into the game, how much it would affect queue times and make queue times better. Because, like, are, is there enough population of people that are just, like, don't care what they play and they'll just play whatever? They just want to play DBD? Because usually, from what I've seen, it, like, if somebody is going to play DBD, like, they're going to play Survivor, going to play Killer. More connected, but it's important to acknowledge that there are significantly more Survivor players on console than there are Killer players. And I believe mm-hmm. a good reason for this is due to the FPS that you get on console. And so, the, the issue you end up having is that you would no longer be able to just play your preferred role because there's just so many people who have to play survivor due to their frame rate because survivor isn't as dependent on frame rate on uh in dbd as opposed to killer where you have to actually aim you have to actually use your power which can cause even more performance issues like in the case of doctor where your console just hits the shitter because you use your static blast and you know yeah So I think there are actually more Survivor players because of that, and so there's a lot of people who just still continue to play Survivor because they have to. And not only that, but a lot of the really fun killers that have like a learning curve to them are harder to play on controller because of the limited sensitivity. So I think it'd be great without crossplay, but now that we do have crossplay, I think that unfortunately that's not really an option. 
until they fix performance issues at the very least. Oh, they did add the um, increased sensitivity a couple months back for controllers. I'll so go with it. it. It's basically double what they had before. Alright, so in that case, they would just have to fix up the uh, performance. Yeah. So but I've part seen people hit by sloppy and it, <laughs> everything just lags for like two seconds and yeah, that's pretty big in DVD. Believe me, my old laptop might as well have been a console. I experienced <laughs> the same thing, but you see, the other thing is that I feel like they're just not going to fix the performance on console and they're just going to wait for everybody to have a PS5 and the new Xbox and then just call it a day. Like, I feel like part of me ends up feeling like that's going to end up being a thing. What do you all think? Uh, I, I think it'll slowly become the case, it, it, but it'll take place over the span of like two years probably, and I, I don't even know if DBD is going to be in its current form in two years, because usually it takes a couple years before they stop supporting like their older platform games, like any developers, and so it's probably not going to happen for a while, but it probably won't be their main concern anymore. They're going to try to develop for PS5 and the new Xbox and everything. All right, is there anybody else who would like to add on to this? On player retention? Yeah. Like, what other topics can we think about? <clears throat> uh, so I have a lot of people that watch my stream that are, like, newer to the game. And one of the biggest complaints that I hear is, like, somebody has, like, 50 hours in the game. They just started playing. They watch, like, a lot of DVD streamers. And then, like, they'll be, like, rank 15, and then they'll go against, like, people, because, like, the matchmaking system is so shit. They'll go against, like, red ranks and purple ranks. And they'll have like a really bad time because they're really new to the game and they just can't even perform against them. And as, yeah, and like, yeah, they'll run into people with like sweat builds and they have like monstrous shrine one <laughs> with, <laughs> with like unrelenting two and like stuff like that. And they just have nothing to use. And then they run into like teams that all have like dead hard and DS and there's nothing they can do. And so I was trying to think of like some way to like alleviate that a little bit that would be easy for behavior to do. And, like, my idea is that I, I think they should implement something to where if you go against, so, like, say you're playing Survivor and you're, like, rank 15, you go against, like, a red rank killer. I think that for each rank discrepancy, uh, you should get a BP boost for, like, the, the, like, how big the discrepancy is. So, like, for each uh, rank set, so you know how there's, like, yellow or, like, brown, yellow, mm -hmm. green, purple, and everything. So each hop over from each rank set should give you a 25% boost to your BP gain at the end of the match. So like if you're a really low rank and you go against like a red rank killer, you'll get like double the blood points because you played against somebody that is, has like so much more time than you. And I think that would alleviate a little bit, like that would alleviate the grind because I know a lot of people complain about the grind and that'd make it feel a little bit better playing against teams that you just can't even compete against because then even if you do get like 10k points, at least you get like the BP boost because... Like, they're outside of your rank set. Hmm. I, I, like I understand, but I, I wonder if that would actually help encourage these players to keep playing. Because, like, um, I know I don't play a lot of killer, uh, but when I do, the same thing happens to me where I'm really discouraged from playing killer uh, because I get these people that are just, like, you know, I'm going against, like, survivors that are, like, my level when I'm, like, a baby killer. Um, and it's kind of frustrating that makes me not want to continue playing killer um and it's like is really making it so people are going to have more blood points going to encourage them and like like I, I don't understand how that's going to alleviate the frustration of going um against someone that is just so clearly better than you because i would honestly even with the extra blood points would be like fuck this i'm gonna go play survivor here's a random i mean lot. at least it's something because, yeah, like, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to, like, teach somebody how to be better at the game. I think what we yeah. could do, though, is mobile recently introduced a training mode, which I don't know how it's not on the PC version of DVD, but it allows you to actually practice uh, whatever killer you, might, you may not be very familiar with, and it just allows you to have some time to actually practice and get the hang of the fundamentals, where I think if a player at least got the grasp of the fundamentals, it wouldn't be so bad, because then they're like, okay, you know what? At least I understand the game a little better and what I'm supposed to do, and they can move on from there. So, you know, yeah, yeah you'll probably still get those very tough games where you just get completely curb stomped, 
but I think that most your games wouldn't be as bad by having those uh, those options, like you know, being able to practice. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is if if you're like a rank eighteen killer and you you know you you would just want to practice and stuff, and then you get two rank fifteen survivors, but they're also with their red rank um, friends. The thing is, you still like get penalized for being bullied. That's like it's so discouraging for people. Yeah, I agree. Like, there's no learning curve to getting completely stomped on either. Yeah. <laughs> like, I could completely demolish. What am I going to learn? How not to get demolished when there was nothing I could do? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, obviously, you can like look back after you have more time in the game and be like. Oh, this person knows how to hug this. This person actually knows how to loop, etc. Like I should have dropped chase and gone for the the weak, but yeah, obviously but like, hindsight twenty twenty. Yeah, sometimes they just they just don't have the game experience to say, oh, I should have dropped that chase and gone to someone else. Like they're we're talking about like new killers. Like they, some of them just don't know because not everyone goes into this game like having watched like big streamers and stuff like that. So sometimes they just don't know. I also think that, uh, I know it's kind of not really related, but I think the tutorial for this game needs to be way better than it is. It is you mean, a joke. You mean where you practice moonwalking on Dwight, right? Like <laughs> it three is hours a an day. absolute joke. Like, I mean, I mean even the mobile one's true. better. True. I why haven't just seen it. The mobile one and put it, they could literally take the mobile one and put it in somehow. Yeah, I don't know why they're... It's, it's good. Yeah, I don't know why they're treating it like two separate entities. Like it's the same game. Like why? <laughs> like, Are you come trying on. to say there should be crossplay with mobile? Um, no, yes. no, no, no. <laughs> oh hell yeah! <laughs> Think of the clips, yeah, yeah, yeah. dude. <laughs> Think of the clips. <laughs> uh, crossplay is already oh god. <laughs> I think another thing they could introduce for player retention is taking a page from Overwatch's book with a consecutive game. Blood point bonus kind of thing. I'm not familiar with that. Um, basically, the more you keep playing, you just keep, like you get you get like a bonus amount of XP to get oh. your next loot box kind of thing. Yeah. You mean per day or? So the more um, you play, the it, the more you get rewarded. Yeah, pretty saying. much. So and then you have like, like your first win of the day bonus, and then you get consecutive game bonuses after that. I wish they did that and devotion rewards because yes. what was the point of putting in devotion if we're not gonna get anything for it? Exactly, it's yeah. just routine. You get shards. You can buy the shrines and get blood points. What do you mean? It's so <laughs> oh, the the early cool. levels don't give shit. <laughs> oh. I'm curious. So we're talking about retention. Do you think mm. DVD has? And no one likes to talk about this, but do you guys think DVD has a lifespan of like? League or CSGO? No. It depends on where they take the game. The way that I see it right now with, like, you know, the frustrating elements that are in the game that haven't really been addressed on a timely fashion, I think DVD could last for a while, right? There's no doubt about it. It has a player base to sustain itself, but I feel like the amount of years the game is going to go on for is going to really come down to what they do to change the game. So, for instance, they definitely put themselves on a hard limit because of the fact they moved the game over to dedicated servers. So this guarantees that the game will eventually die when they stop paying for the servers. Because I doubt they're going to go through the effort to put it back on a peer-to-peer -peer when everything new has been coded around the servers. So yeah. the game has a lifespan now that they've done that. And so... If they go down the path that they're going down right now, which is, you know, you get a bunch of killers that are either not so fun to go against, or you get some builds that are not so fun to go against, or, you know, even maps that people don't really like, for instance, with the breakable walls and dead zones, so you get, like, things that killers don't like and things that survivors don't like. I feel like, you know, the game maybe has a couple of years to it, but I feel like it could have a really long life if they really start cracking down on the issues with this game. That's the main issue, though. It takes them so long to do anything. Mm -hmm. Like, any minor issue will take them, like, months, sometimes even years, just to fix. Yeah. They don't even fix it. 
Like, there's countless bugs that existed since the fucking game was still in alpha, and it's still here, and it's just that they never fix it. Yeah. I, I think... think... To mention, uh, sometimes they'll, you know, get rid of a bug, and then a couple patches later it just comes back, and then it takes them a million years to patch it again. It's like, well, okay then. <laughs> or they patch a bug, and another bug comes, and that bug takes forever to get yeah. patched, and it's just a vicious cycle. They have the benefit of filling this very niche spot in the market, and that's, you know, being able to play Michael Myers in a video game. Like, what other game offers that? And I think they're kind of abusing that spot that they have by, you know, not giving back to the community and, like, you know, fixing things that have been problems in the game for so long. Yeah. So I kind of wonder, so the devs, it appears they, that they really want to go over and like do a pass on all the maps. Do you think after they do a pass on like majority of the maps, do you think they're going to start gearing towards fixing gameplay elements? Because I wonder if they're just purely focusing on maps right now and then worrying about gameplay elements later. I would hope so. Because like, I mean, to be honest, I would, I would love for them to just maybe take one chapter break like where they would just work on a chapter and just work on the gameplay stuff that just needs to be worked on. But that would be amazing if they are like are just planning on after working on the maps to do that. Mm -hmm. I think if the other thing is the prioritization on changes, for instance, like uh, a, wh a while ago, as we know, they nerfed Billy. But the thing that uh, that got me is like, you know, where are their priorities at? Like, for instance, they wanted to nerf Billy even though they talked about every reason as to why he's totally balanced and completely fair in the game when you have other things in the game that are more problematic that got changed way later on, such as uh, Pyramid Head, who actually got like a slight buff as opposed to a nerf. You have other killers like Oni, who I think it's fine in his base kit, but he has add-ons that are more ridiculous, such as Scalp Top Knot or the Lion Fang. And I feel like, you know, the prioritization is really off when it comes to uh, this game as well, and the changes that it needs. So we can end up getting changes that people may want, but the priorities are off. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes they come out with, like, reworks or changes that were just like, who, who exactly was asking for this? Because, like, you see just a lot of people complaining about, you know, like, Spirit or Death Slinger or something like that. And then they come out with, like, a Billy nerf. It's like, who who asked you to do... No one asked you to do that. Um, it, it's just, yeah, where are their priorities? Because there's a lot of people with a lot of experience in this game who should be trusted because they've played this game for so long. Um, and they're all saying the same thing. But for some reason, they just don't really want to hear it or it happens way after people start asking for it. And it's just really weird. Yeah, so I think their priorities are definitely off. And perhaps the last thing that I think we could probably go over is the grind. Like, do we think that the grind has gotten so much to the point where that could also be hurting players? Because they realize that they're getting into this game and all of a sudden they have... 70 perks, half of them are useless, half of them are pretty decent, and maybe a few of them are actually really damn good. And they just don't know what to go for because they're just so overwhelmed. It's like, wow, there's like 80 perks I have to level up on both sides. And I have to like, I have to actually level up my killers first before I'm able to get it. What do we think about the grind? Painful. I think it's really daunting <laughs> for someone new. It's very yeah. big. Um... Yeah, I think what they could do is like, like first thing they could take, uh, they could take away perk tiers. I feel. Mm, no... I can agree. I, like, I don't think they're ever gonna do that though. I don't think they will either, but that would be a way to help the grind. Yeah. Because like, how like once you get to level fifty, like how many other blood webs do you have to go if you're trying to get like perk, uh, all perks, you know, P three fifty. I think it's over. You have to go through. You have to go through a lot of blood webs. So. I feel like that would be one way to help. I don't think they will either. I agree with you, Will. But, you know, that would help. Yeah. I, th I think one of the biggest things is if they allowed us to actually recycle things. 
So if you yes. like if you're playing killer and you yep. get like 50 Lampkin lane offerings, you're never going to use them. And so if I could recycle them and get just half the value of it, like that would be so so good into putting blood points into other things that I want. Like a market. Like or I, I would also like it if they uh, did what mobile does and have a combined inventory uh, for like your entire side. So like all survivors on mobile have the same combined inventory and all the uh, the killers have like the same combined inventory for like offerings. And so I'd make it to where like people can feel like they can play other like killers or play like other survivors because they at least have something on them. And like then the perks are individual. Um, I like that idea. Though. I like that idea a lot too. For for offerings and stuff. Same I think here. It took me 1,200 hours to unlock all perks on Survivor and Killer. Something stupid like that. You can actually do it faster depending on how many friends you have. <laughs> oh, true, true. <laughs> friends? Yeah, no. I, I can't a, do that. For example, like when I had to uh, make, get a new account again because of uh, reasons. Anyhow, <laughs> so. I, I tried to go, to go back as quickly as possible and get like a max account. And then I realized halfway through uh, after I've been grinding for like, um, what was it? Four weeks straight, something like that. I only played like uh, Survivor Friends with uh, like get ghettos, party streamers and stuff. I wasn't even halfway. And I play a lot of DVD. I played even more back then. And even with all of these extra blood points, I could never get the grind during the time I needed it the most. Yeah. Because, like, it just takes so long. And and that entire grind, I got, like, what was it, 200 million blood points. That was enough to get, like, basically half of the survivors prestiged at that time. And then I could also get the killers, well, not prestiged, the teachables. And then I couldn't really do much more than get the teachables. Like, I think another it. thing they could do is just take away the blood point um, cap. Yeah. Please. <laughs> I actually had an idea for that because, like, right now there's no devotion rewards. And I was actually curious, like, what they could do with the devotion rewards is make it to where every time you reach a devotion, your blood point cap goes up by 100,000. That way, and that would really benefit, like, content creators or, like, people that really play the game a lot because when something new does come out, then like you have like an extra bank for it and like you can show it off and so people can learn more about the meta because people can actually start running stuff. Yeah. That would that'd be, really that'd be, be helpful. Amazing. Yeah, I agree. Like uh, it would be really helpful because then people can see what works and what doesn't because you already have it maxed out and they can be like, okay, now I know what to focus on if I want to play this killer or, oh, I know what I want to focus on if I want to play Survivor based off of the new perks and new changes. Yeah. I like that idea a lot. It actually gives you something for having devotion. <laughs> like right now it's kind of meaningless. <laughs> it kind of just is like um here I play this game entirely too long. <laughs> just level up hag and bite, you'll be fine. Do we have anybody <laughs> in the devotion ten plus club in here? Yep. I'm, I'm devotion, devotion twenty five. Uh, 30 um, Jesus. Holy yeah, crap. My main account had oh 23, God. level 50. Uh, my second one had devotion 2 something. And then my current one has devotion 5, level 70. And then I also played a fuck ton on my friends' accounts, making their rift levels from like level 0 to level 45, and then playing t so they maxed out. So, like, I basically can play. How much is it? About two entire rifts worth every rift. Jeez. I'm only devotion 15. Mm. I'm, I'm, a <laughs> I'm somewhere <laughs> above devotion 10. I just don't know what number it is exactly. Probably 11 or 12. Mm. I, don't I think know. I'm like halfway to devotion 18. Nice. Oh. Alright, we're going to need to talk about how high your devotion levels are. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, please. <laughs> so, like, going into the the rift and like kind of tying it in with the uh, the grind. I don't know if you guys have ever played a Rainbow Six Siege, but in Siege, like, there's boosters for XP where like you somebody can run a booster and they it's like active for like 24 hours, and then like any games that they play in that they get like double XP for that. I wonder if it'd be good for them to replace like all the filler trinkets that nobody uses that just takes up inventory space. Uh, with like BP boosters or shard boosters in the uh, 
in the rift. I think that would be neat. I think what they should do is, there's actually a number of things I want them to do with the rift. So there's a lot of empty slots, especially for the free track. And I think this is a real chance to help out newer players. So for instance, when you come into the game, there's also a lot of DLCs to pick up. A lot more than when I picked up the game where the only DLCs you could really pick from were Doctor, Myers, and Hag, and that's literally it. Like, that was when I first joined. So, there's a lot more DLC in this game nowadays, and I feel like what would be really cool is to have what mobile does with the, uh, like, the character ticket where you can unlock a character for 24 hours. I think it only works on originals, if I'm not mistaken, but whatever they do with it, I think it'd be great, and then on top of that, I think they should add shards to the rift, and also, like you said, the uh, boosters, because I think this could turn the uh, rift from being just, you know, a massive grind uh, opportunity to being something that could actually help newer players play catch-up game, but it would also be at a uh, in a way where there would always be a new DLC release, so it's not even to hurt behavior's pockets, really, for the most part. It'll just be there to help new players who would otherwise spend over $100 on DLC, not even counting cosmetics they might want to get as well. I've also had a friend tell me this, that like he, he barely plays like actual games. He, may, he mainly is placing killer friends and stuff. But he would love like a mechanic, because he has everything in the game. Like, why can't he just give people blood points? Like, I mean, then just blocking in and giving blood points, or...? No, no, I mean, like, just give blood points from the blood points he has earned, just donate them to other people. Oh, okay. I mean, that kind of goes back in, like, the booster thing, because, like, in yeah. Siege, if you activate a booster, uh, then everybody that's in your lobby gets a 10% boost to their points. And so, like, that would be kind of cool if you could, like, like, go into, like, any lobby and, like, somebody has a booster, oh, you get more blood points out of it. Just because mm -hmm. they're running it. Similar to a party streamer, but... Mm -hmm. Except it's just like a separate system. Yeah. I mean, hell, wouldn't it also be a nice idea, like, what if we just did away with blood point offerings and just had boosters, and it would be indicated as to who is uh, running a booster, so that way people know when to bring them or not. Yeah, yeah because... Oh, that's one of the most fun things to do. It's scamming party streamers. <laughs> Please run <laughs> streamers and just run an escape cake. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, uh, please run streamers and then like uh, you just burn like a uh, you you bring like a shroud and you just sandbag everybody. Easy. So this reminds me of a system they have in Heroes of the Storm, where you can buy a booster and there's different time period ones. It's like seven days, one month, one year, and every time the game starts, it shows you that. You're getting X amount bonus XP from this player and this player and this player. And like maybe something like that. And it would stack with other people. Uh maybe something like that, yeah. So I just wanted to make sure I wasn't gonna interrupt anybody. I, I mean know. There's like a number of ideas that they could do to actually make the uh, rift more interesting because I feel like, you know, right now, the way that it is right now is like Alright, you either buy the Rift or you get nothing out of it, even though I feel like the Rift, like the way that I look at the Rift is that it's a tool that could really be used to really help out new players and keep them in the game. Because the design kind of perfectly fits that, where it's like, you get some cosmetics, you get to uh, play out the challenges in order to get more blood points, which you could use to level up your characters, but then suddenly you're in the scenario where it's like, but here's the catch. You gotta buy the Rift. You gotta get the characters, and it's like... It's such a missed opportunity to actually help new players play catch-up game. With people who have thousands of hours in the game, who already have these characters leveled up. And I feel like the experienced players are really the only ones that can actually benefit out of it right now. What do you guys think? And, and the Rift kinda sucks as well, because if you're a Survivor player and you're playing uh, for the Archives... Uh, after you get all the archives done, survivors get less XP on average than killers because a lot of the XP gain is based off of the, uh, the emblem system. And so if you play a match, it, like if you spend 15 minutes like playing out a match and queuing and everything, you're probably going to get less XP than the killer that's in that match just because it's harder to get your like four iridescent emblems compared to the killer. 
so you would like like a emblem XP boost overall. Yeah, probably. I mean, I kind of want to be honest with you. I kind of want them to like rework how survivors get blood points because like one of the biggest things that sucks is like if you like if the killer tunnels you for like three or four gens, you're gonna have the least amount of blood points in the entire game. And so it'd be cool if you got like emblem scoring and also blood point scoring for like if somebody's doing a generator while you're running the killer, like that gen progress, uh, like you get a little bit of like the objective points for that. Or like if somebody gets healed or saved, you get a little bit of points for that as well. And it like fills out your altruism and objective and everything. Because if you're running the killer, then like you're the reason why things are getting done. Like one of the things I noticed was during the event that we just had, like when they get a blighted generator done and you were running the killer, you get like the blood points. So that was always nice because they're getting gens done, you're getting the points, but you're also like running the killer, which is one of the most fun aspects for me personally. I would I would say that helps focus team working more because otherwise it's just your points that matter, not the others. Mm-hmm. And, that, and, that, and that depending on which survivor it is, it can even throw the entire game, depending on how greedy they are for their points. I don't know if you guys know this, but there's all there's that score event. Uh, it's called distraction, which is altruism. And you kind of get it when you're near another survivor and the killer's there. But, like, that could probably fill that void, but obviously go into the other category. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I just want to make sure I'm not interrupting everyone again. (laughs) (laughs) Is anybody else, like, doing that where, like, they just don't want to interrupt anybody? Try my best. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to help yeah. people talk. <laughs> so when it comes down to that, like, I think that is something that could actually work out as well because, I mean, I I feel like you already explained it pretty well. So I'm I'm trying to like explain my part, but I just have nothing more to add on to it. How about anybody else? I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we could probably move on to the next topic. Well, actually, yeah. there's still a couple of things we can go on about the Rift. Like, okay. for instance, because uh, the Rift is one of our major topics tonight. How about the uh, challenges? How do you feel about the challenges? Do we feel like they're good, they're bad? <laughs> <laughs> they're pretty boring. Like, I feel like a lot of them are just play the game for a long time. And, I mean, for some of us that play DBD a lot, it's probably, like, no problem. Uh, But people who play this game more casually are probably not very happy with those. And also, they feel very repetitive. Like, I mean, there's like some challenges in there. I'm like, wait, didn't I already do this? And then it's like, oh, but it's in a single trial. So I guess it's different. (laughs) Escape one trial. Complete in a single trial. (laughs) Yeah, there's only really so many things you can do. Escape challenges. It's true. (laughs) One thing that I've noticed... I noticed a lot of, not necessarily a lot of them, but there are some, like, killer challenges that make you play in a really scummy way. Like, in, like, one of the first rifts, it was, like, get kill everyone in basement. So you had a lot of, like, face camping bubbas or agitation iron grass bubbas that were just, like, playing in a really unfun way for survivors, like, necessarily. That was so, so interactive, what do you mean? <laughs> All right. for, for that one, I just played Billy, and I just stood right outside a terror radius, so they want to get BT, I'll just come back. <laughs> It's yeah. so bad. Like it's catering to like in a weird way to play. And then on the spirit one, it was like kill the spirit, like get four kills with the spirit, any means necessary. So obviously I don't play killer. I loaded up an Ebony Mori spirit. Just went right on in and played pretty I'm scummy. Angry. I'm disgusted. Like, <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I felt so bad. Um, <laughs> apologies not gonna work here, but I, I didn't expect <laughs> it. Let's also talk about how boring the perk restriction archives are. Lightborn hit M1 survivors 10 times. Yeah. I mean, what's even the correlation there? Like, I get they want to have all the perks involved, but, like, what even is the correlation between M1-ing and flashlights? I guess they're in front of you. Something they could do for that one is, like, evade a flashlight, but then you don't know how many games that's going to take. Like, they could have, like, evade five flashlights, but that's going to take, you know, maybe two games, maybe, like, four, depending on what kind of survivors you get. So, I mean, they don't really have much options that they can go with that route. Could you imagine if eight fla- five flashlights complete in a single trial? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Dude, that I, mean, I think what they're trying to do... Up. 
I think what they're trying to do with like the archives, if they're trying to like kind of nudge people towards different metas and like that's why they're trying to make people run like lightborn or run different perks kind of like oh like this perk exists and like this is what it does like just play a match with it and see what it does but most people like they'll play a match of it and they'll be like oh yeah it does nothing <laughs> and then just throw it away again <laughs> yeah. it's like this wow is... thanks for confirming my uh for confirming my hunches this perk is worthless <laughs> exactly two this chases tinker a ruin and dying oh my god <laughs> escape two chases while while using urban evasion that was so much i'm not fun. doing that one i'm not <laughs> doing that were screaming okay buddy Watch yourself. dude i can't wait <laughs> for the i can't wait for the hag tome where they're probably gonna do using ruin grab five people off your totems minrag hag here we come to be fair urban evasion is a neo perk by the way so As... aaron what was, was that neo perk by the way yeah, yeah. Coming at Claudette, it's like that. It's kind of weird. Yeah, kind of weird champ, but it's true. Yep. No, sure. I don't see many Shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you much. know what's another challenge that I don't like? Keys. I actually really. Keys. Well, not just keys, but there's a really big one: emblem challenges, because oh, a lot uh, of them are literally just, hey. Play this game several times, except uh, if you play in a certain way, you won't get it anyways. Like, uh, I know they have one where it's like, get like 20 iridescent emblems, and it's like, alright, yeah, that's not, like, hard to get. But you see, the issue is, if I'm playing Killer, for instance, then I'm entirely reliant on the survivors not just throwing themselves at me. Like, because I have, like, a very uh, pressure-heavy style where, like, I slug a lot, the problem is that... If I slug everybody because they run into my face, and I feel like that's the best method, I'm not going to get my iridescent emblems that fast. I'll probably have to play, play, like, you know, eight games in order to get it. Or, you know, if you're playing Survivor, you know, you can't really help it if you can't really do everything, because, say you get chased the entire game. Well, you couldn't do the gen, so you couldn't get your iridescent emblem there. Because the killer never downed anybody, you didn't get an iridescent in uh, Benevolence. And, you know what? Let's say you got face camped at the end because he finally caught you with, uh, let's say, no other rancor at the end, or, you know, he had some kind of other, uh, insta down chan uh, not insta yeah, an insta down perk that got activated at the end, and now suddenly, you don't get your unbroken emblem. So, you could end up playing a lot of games as Survivor, and you know what, maybe your teammates just don't do anything, you just don't get it from that either. So, it ends up being this, uh, case where you're expected to, uh, get a certain result, but you can't really get that because you're relying on other players in order to get that far. Yeah. I've literally ran the killer for five gens and escaped and deep pipped before. Oh my god. <laughs> that happens better. to me all the time. It's I infuriating. I should have just played better. Should have yeah, yeah. played better forehead. That and happens get like 14k. So it's like, like alright, well. And I had the lowest points, of course. <laughs> yeah. I just ran the... Everyone else got a, you know, free double pip. I can actually yeah. tell a story about that. So I was helping a guy get the world record most escapes in a Rosa Survivor. And we went from rank one. Uh, but by the time he finally died, eventually, uh, and lost the streak to a um, Noid Hunter's on Hawkins. <clears throat> and he went from rank one to rank 13. Oh my that, that's how much we kept destroying the killers. Like, wow. Yeah. Like, we kept getting 5-gen chases every game, and we keep kept de-pipping. And it was the most boring thing that I've ever experienced. Like, we did everything. We played optimally. And t in terms of the game mechanic, we lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is like... Yeah, it's like win the game, but not don't do it that well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess, like, the other thing is that it would end up becoming more boring because the players that you're against become less knowledgeable because you're just deep pipping at that point because, like, you're doing so well, you lose. Exactly. You, you play so well, and then you keep getting worse people to play against, and then they get, uh, you, they lose, and then you get even worse and worse and worse. It's and basically so the shit stomping becomes even better. It just skyrockets. Exactly, and I don't understand why that's even a thing. Perfect ranking system, that's why. Like, yeah. if 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 a team can just demolish any killer after killer, they should be high rank. If they can't do that, they should be middle. That's how a rank system should work, but this game doesn't 
have what it takes. And when the only time they even tried it was the MMR system, and that went really well. <laughs> was, honestly, we don't talk oh, about MMR. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I had one game where I had Tinker go off, and uh, I don't know if this is like new Tinker or old Tinker, but there was this Jake on Blood Lodge, right? And I was playing Oni, so you you would think that because of the amount of times I play Oni, that I would get some pretty decent survivors if MMR was working, right? Let me tell you what the Shake did. He looked at me, and then slowly entered a locker, thinking that I didn't see him. <laughs> yeah, you, you didn't. <laughs> what do you mean? He's not there. He's not in the locker, and then I think he killed himself on hook afterwards. Stop hacking, bro. <laughs> I think behavior is just trying to flame you, to be honest. <laughs> Probably. I mean, honestly, that's just the ultimate uh, roast ever, honestly, if that's what they were thinking. It's like, alright, how do we best roast our players? I got it. We're going to flip the MMR system around. I mean, like, I, I was getting people, and, like, I, I play pretty much every killer, and so, like, there was no killer that had, like, or should have had low MMR, and I was getting people to where it was literally their first game. Like, they had 0 0.1 yeah. hours in DBD, and it's like, <laughs> One imagine, imagine going against me, somebody that has 6,000 6, hours in the game, and you have, this is your first game of Dead by Daylight. Welcome to DBD. Yeah. I'm like, I don't yeah. even want to go against you. you want... I couldn't imagine doing it right as I loaded I've up the game. I've against this man. For days in a row. <laughs> Very good. So if I only had 0.1 hour, yeah. I wouldn't have a good time. Exactly. That brings me to another story about the whole MMR system where... So for me, I have like a uh, a way where people can request that I use Top Knot, except you have to watch for a very long time. So when you get to 50,000 points, you can request Top Knot. And while the MMR system was up, someone actually made 50,000 points, redeemed it. <laughs> and I literally got people who were playing for their first time ever... And they literally almost quit the game because it was just a completely unfair match. And it's like, thanks, behavior. I don't want to run this add-on, but because I have to now, uh, you just basically made a bunch of people almost quit the game because they don't want to deal with that at all. Yeah. We got that, too. Like, when I like was playing Survivor on MMR, we had people that, like, I'm pretty sure we got, like, a hundred <laughs> first game ever. And we had to sit there and be like, no, please, I'm sorry. This is you're not supposed to be going against us. Please keep trying. Like, don't quit this game. You know, because it just it's so discouraging to the first ever game you load up into to go against people that are just have so much more experience than you. It's like the saddest thing in the world when you like go against a player that's very obviously very inexperienced and the first thing they say in post game chat is just like sad face. <laughs> oh my god. I just feel that so bad. That's kind of why we should always just mute in game chat. <laughs> so we don't feel bad for our sins. <laughs> just leave. Oh, pretend you didn't see it. <laughs> Some of the best content comes from in game chat. True. That's true, <laughs> true. Some of the best insults, too. Oh, <laughs> oh my yeah. god, ball spammer. <laughs> yep. How dare you spam your bottles or your hatchets? Stop it. How dare you loop me? How dare you uh, abuse OP looping? Barbecue right. and cheater. <laughs> How didn't Chase activate? Well, I still vaulted every wind in front of you. Yeah, I, 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 I lose I, when I vaulted every LT wall. I've had somebody before with the uh, the old Bubba, where in the post game chat they said I was a no skill M2 only Bubba with, with the old Bubba. <laughs> Dude, I I shit you not. It gets no even better skill. when you go on. It gets even better when you go onto the forum. So, for instance, I remember looking at one post, and this one person was saying something along the lines of, "Dude, this person was so bad at the game. He only uses chainsaw as hillbilly." And I'm just sitting there like, "What?" <laughs> well, uh, chainsaw for distance. <laughs> That's what the point. That's the point. <laughs> That's the skill remember, cap, Billy. M1 equals skills. Mm -hmm. Dude. My favorite I think skill. Told me pretty much the same thing with Huntress. They're like, you only use your hatchets. How's that skillful? And I'm like, all right. Dude, my favorite form of skill is that you run Bamboozle with uh, Spirit Fury Enduring, and then you also put on. Um, Good. In the next update, you put on Coupe de Grasse with it. Mmm, skillful. Oh my God. The whole W build. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you want to play the game? No. The one for lunch. Yes. I did a video on that, and like, I I hope they never take out demos, demo shred. 
I think they will, unfortunately. They will. But it's hilarious because he just (laughs) freezes frame and just like zooms like halfway across the map. It's great. I'm actually very scared to see that perk on Deathslinger and Nurse. Nurse, I I tried it on. Uh, well, their their lunges are like the same, so the only ones that like it really affected was like spirit. Spirits <laughs> out of phase was like really far. Um, demos is bugged, so his was really far. Oni's was farther too, but it's bugged. And then the biggest one was Pig's dash, and she like quite literally went like halfway across Springwood Street. <laughs> it was it's insane. How far she can go with her dash, but it's bugged, so they'll take it out. I'm about to moon dash across the entire shack. With that <laughs> new perk. You literally can. <laughs> it's great. Although the one thing is, that I think it'll also be really good on Oni because of the fact that he can get his power more easily with the extended lunge. Because it's literally pig's power, but a perk. Yeah. Although I have many... people saying it's OP, but it's like it's after a gen stud, you're losing the game and getting the value out of the perk. Something tells me we've actually gone very far away from uh, the rift. <laughs> very. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> just, this, just... this perk might be on the rift, so. Just in the future. <laughs> we'll pretend that the twins is actually the next killer in the uh, next rift. Uh-huh. Get a hit through a pallet five times in a single match. <laughs> yes, please. Hit the survivor and have a pallet immediately get dropped on you. Escape, two times, in one... Escape two times in one trial. Must be done within uh, five minutes of opening the game. I hope there's a challenge to kick picture like five times in one game. I will be so oh happy. <laughs> For some reason, I, w- I actually doubt that would be a thing. Come on, I, be great. <laughs> I feel like based off the drama going on with uh, Victor, I think they're I think they'd be a little bit too afraid to actually do a challenge like that. <laughs> Challenge, kidnap Victor. I can help. <laughs> Put on knowledge with Victor kick, on your back. Kick Victor <laughs> twice in a, in a trial. <laughs> Please. Well, what other challenges are things that we actually don't like in the Rift? And what are some challenges that we actually do like? I, I really dislike the one where it just says kill the obsession. Like, I get my obsession, I tunnel them to death. Alright, now I tunnel the next guy. I get DS, I get another obsession. Like, that's the entire thing. It's just going after one person all the time, and I, I, I don't really like rifts that is focusing on one person dying. I like, really it, don't do the rifts too much. I kind of stopped after, like, they take me, like, three, four games, and I just kind of got mm-hmm. bored of them. I really feel like they should be one to two. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Carter. I didn't know if you were done. That's fine. I'm basically done. Yeah, I kind of feel like it, it should either be like where you can get it done in one match, or if it is across multiple matches, it should be something that you're going to do anyways. So, yeah. like, if it's going to be like one that's going to take multiple games, it needs to be something like, okay, as, yeah, as Survivor completed gen or like as Killer down people. That way you yeah. can just like play it and then just like passively get it over time. Instead of like having to play in a very specific way for like five matches in a row, and even then, like yep. you may not get it. Yeah, I agree. Yep. Now, how about being allowed to pick one survivor challenge and one killer challenge at the same time? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that I think that's a that no brainer. <laughs> I don't understand why that's not something you can do anyway. Or just having multiple at the same time as a killer, so you don't have to go in the rift, pick it, claim it, repeat. For every single one, it's genuinely boring to stay in there. Half the time I'll get one done, and then I won't even realize it for like five games. And then by the time I realize it, I've been in queue for five minutes, so I'm not going to unready up to grab yeah. one. Yeah. So there needs to be like a better UI where like you can get into a game and still choose from there. Not like that, but what if they had like, you know, a planned rift track option where um, what you do is... You select the challenge, and then what you do is you kind of drag your mouse through the challenges that you want to do in a in a particular order. So that way, you don't even have to go into that page anymore. You just look to see uh, what your current challenge is, and that's it. That would be nice. I think it would be nice, too, if it just auto-moved to, like, say it was, like, in a straight line, and it just auto-moved to it. Didn't claim it for you yet? Yeah. Well, I don't know how that would work, because people would just wait to claim them. But... You have to claim certain ones to unlock different tracks, though. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I was just thinking if they change the rift though, we're automatically moved to the next one. So, and then mm -hmm. there's like a little pop up saying, "This is your challenge." I mean, I do like that idea to where like it automatically switches, so like you could click like all the way down towards the end of the the archive, the one like that you can't even access yet, and then it'll find like the best path to go to that, and that way like you, whenever you complete one, it just automatically puts another one on. Plus, so I, I, I do really like that one. To go for. Yeah, yeah. That would be nice. and Plus, I also what I really want is I want them to have like some indicator while you're in the game of you actually finishing the challenge, because I've had so many oh, games yeah. like as Survivor yeah. to where. Like, I'll think that I get it, and then, nope, It apparently the game has decided I didn't get that challenge, and so, like, that kind of sucks. Especially awesome. like, right. up in, like, the top right or something that just comes up and says, you know, congrats, you completed three gens. Mm -hmm. right. I'm mainly thinking of, like, the chaser quests. Yeah, like, we have to get chased for, like, a minute or so? Well, it's normally, like, three minutes, but yeah. Or three minutes, whatever. I don't know how long it is. That would yeah. be nice. I definitely wish there was a way that like you could see what your challenge is and the progress on your challenge while in game so you can know like if you need more chase time you can get yourself more chase time or if you need to do another gen do another gen you know <laughs> or sometimes like if i'm streaming <laughs> sometimes i just forget what challenge i'm doing like <laughs> it's just i'm like wait what did i select again and you just I go through the game and you're like, well, I hope, <laughs> I hope I get it. Well, I guess what they could do as well, and I'm taking the chaser one, for example, is um, where the offerings are, like maybe below that or something. They had like a rift challenge that you have selected right now and it shows the progress because it has it in end game. I wonder like how hard that would be for them to implement that. So actually someone in the chat, uh, Deoxidine actually brought up a pretty good idea. What if it showed oh, you your current challenge? Sense when you press escape. Yeah, that's pretty much what yeah. I was trying to say. Fair. I agree. I didn't see that too. But yeah, I think that would be, uh, I think that'd be way easier. Yeah, no, I agree. Like, uh, there's just so many ways that they could improve the rift, and I think, you know, it'd be really nice if they did that, but I have a feeling that they might not exactly focus on the, uh, the rift quite as uh soon i'm just a curious question i had this happen to me about a week ago for about four hours i was unable to access the uh, archive do you know what caused it nope it just said it's not available at this time you can't and, and, from the archives basically <laughs> <laughs> Damn, man, how do you get yourself banned out of the archives? They did them too quickly, what can I say? <laughs> Shit, you just gotta do it slower. Yeah, I just like the emblem system. <laughs> I hate the emblem challenges so much. <laughs> so what else about the Rift? Are we pretty content with uh, Rift, or do we have any other discussion ideas for it? I'm pretty good on it. Yeah, I'm pretty good. I think yeah. um, I think we crossed most points that needed to be crossed. All right. So the next thing that I would like to go over tonight is the fun of this game. So in Dead by Daylight, there's a lot of uh, well, by a lot I mean mostly the same mechanics that we've had for years. But I feel like this ties into uh, player retention in a way. But you know, in its own topic, there's a lot of things that we tend to find fun in this game. So you know. DVD wouldn't be as popular if, uh, as it is if it didn't fill in the niche that people want out of it, and that's, you know, the chase. It's basically, you could say that DVD is freeze tag, but it's horror-themed, essentially. Mm. Funny thing yeah. about that is I read a post in the forum that said they should get rid of, like, Windows palettes and the looping aspect of the game and make it all stealth. <laughs> oh my and god. Oh, no. As, as no. funny as that is to think about, one... I would have already uninstalled if that was in the like update, but like Same. if they would have went that direction in the beginning, I don't think DVD would have made it to where it is now doctor. at all. Oh um, my god, exactly. That that was the funny thing is that was the initial direction of the game, and they had to like think on their feet because that's not how people played it. Yeah. So uh, that's true. Yeah, but just imagine if they didn't change their direction with it, like. I wouldn't be playing this game right now. I think DVD would have died 
within a within a year had they not gone the direction that they did now. Yeah. Which is funny, because like earlier we were talking about how you know they still need to improve the direction that they're going in, otherwise the game will still die. But I feel like you know I think that was the first really good decision they made to make DBD more about the chases because that's where the player to player interaction comes from, and that's where the actual skill in the game comes from because. There's no skill in just putting on, you know, the blend that outfit. You're crouching in a bush in, like, uh, one of the new maps or whatever, like Midwitch, or you're on Dead Dog, or Bad Ham, and you just kind of crouch there and just hide. That's not the skill cap in the game. The skill cap in the game is being involved in chases and actively outplaying the other uh, player involved and trying to think of uh, what mind games they might be going for, getting in their head, and then for the killer, using your power in order to down them, or if you're playing like an M1 killer, using M1 mind games in order to outbrain them. Yeah, the cat and mouse. Exactly. And so, I feel like that's where the fun of the game comes from, the mechanics. However, I feel like there's also some mechanics in the game that really don't serve much of a purpose, or could serve uh, more purpose in the base part of the game. So for instance, totems. If you think about totems, they don't really have a purpose other than to be blood point generators when there's no hex totems in effect. Like, how do we feel about totems and the fact that, you know, they just have no impact on the base game? I wouldn't uh, mind if it had, like, some base slowdown, but that would also require some perks to be a bit nerfed, but still, like, just having normal slowdown sometimes would be like a big issue like on gen's healing you remove one totem you now do everything a little bit faster i wouldn't mind that but that would be the interesting. The, yeah but the issue is that there's still too many powerful killer perks to counter anything so i don't think that could be a thing until certain perks get nerfed and certain uh killer add-ons mm. <laughs> Um, one idea I've always had and this is kind of like a little bit off topic but one idea I've always had for like maps is I've never understood why like maps they show you where like the totems are and everything but I feel like they should give you like a slight boost to cleansing the totems as well because currently like there's really not much reason to run a map if you like know the totem locations or like if you're running like detective's hunch and like especially with like the totem meta it's becoming more of a thing with rune and dying i feel like that would be like a small little buff like even if it's just like 10 percent, like you cleanse totems 10 percent faster if you have a map that'd be cool i wouldn't mind that yeah no i would will like they do that the same thing will they do the same thing for detectives or no uh, you mean with the speed i would say that speed. would be nice but that that will also have to buff small game too with that right so, with, with I guess that with the map, though, like with the I don't think it like... should stack, but I think it should have that effect. I actually had an idea for Detectives uh, Hunch that I brought up on the last podcast, where the way it would work is it would work the way it is right now, where whenever a generator gets done, you would see the auras of anything that's within what sixty-four meters within yourself, or it might be like fifty-four, something around that range. And my idea is, what if they kept the perk like that, but whenever you complete a generator your teammates also see the same auras. That'd be insane. That would be pretty Strong. powerful, though, because, like, mm. especially if you're in a swift, it's like, all right, I'm going to pop this gem, we're going to see four totems, and we're all going to go cleanse a totem, except for unless someone's in chase. But oh. in a good swift, it doesn't really matter. That's so true. That, yeah, that's that's true. That, that is true. I guess even, like, without it, though. And plus, you would have to uh, you would have to ask yourself because that would be really good in solo. But in Survivor Friends, does it really replace a perk like, let's say, Sprint Burst or Unbreakable, DS, Dead Hard? You know, like the meta. Does it really replace one of those perks? Because if it does, I'd quite honestly take the new Detective's Hunch over that. Well, you take I, Detectives, especially in the solos, if you're playing against Ruin and Dying a lot. And that's all I was gonna say. Sorry, Joe. Uh, oh no, it's fine. I but I do think that's the direction that they should be going with like the game meta is they need to give more information for solo queue survivors so that they can match like even like swifts. So like, and a lot of people suggest this, but I think they need to add in like kindred as base, just yeah. so everybody knows. Because like if you're playing a, a swift, like you can say like, oh, I'm going for the save, and then like you just stay on the generator. 
And that's that's even though that's like so simple, like that actually affects the game so so much that one person staying on the gen. And so like small little things like that, like Kindred being like base or like Detective's Hunch, like everybody sees the totems. Like since that has like the possible like top power potential of like you being in a swift and you just, t- just telling people where the totems are. Like, I don't really see that being a problem of, like, solo queues knowing that as well. Because then they can bounce the game around that instead of just having, like, one extreme and the other. Plus, another idea I had was that, um, you know Buckle Up, right? How where if you recover, it makes the aura change color, right? Like, the intensity is shown by the aura color. Yeah, mm. That should be base game, that's pretty that, cool. That's what I was I about agree. to say. I think that yeah. should be base game, and then they should uh, change Buckle Up to compensate for that. So, like, as an idea... They make the uh, aura reading effect baseline where you can see how recovered someone is because that's basic info that any survivor friend is going to be able to tell. But you see, solos can't communicate that. But with that being baseline, it would give you more information and more direction on what to do in your game before actually going to pick them up. And then as an idea, maybe they can make it so way if the killer is within a certain amount of uh, distance from a slug survivor, Buckle Up will reveal the killer to you. And then if you're the one on the ground and the killer walks by you on the ground, then you'd reveal the killer's uh, position to all the other survivors instead. So you you have this idea where it buffs solo queues in both ways, but it doesn't really do anything for survivor friends that would be re- able to relay both forms of information anyways. I think that'd be, that'd be, that'd be a cool idea change for Buckle Up. And I don't think it would be like uh, too powerful or anything. Exactly, it would just be something to bridge the gap. Which I think, you know, ultimately, when it comes to the fun of the game, I think bridging the gap would end up really allowing more people to have fun because suddenly you won't need to get your whole gang online to actually have fun. You just be like, ah, you know what? These solo survivors uh, have information now. I can actually play solo. Until you realize they run directly into the killer, and then you probably want to wait on your friends again. But, like, uh, I think that would be one way to really improve the fun factor of the game. What about any other perks? What do you guys think? Is there any other orating perks that you think could be changed to where it would benefit solos more, but it's also in a way where that's just information fire friends have anyways? Bond. Yeah. I think Bond. Yeah, like, Bond is nice and all, but essentially doesn't do anything if you're in, like, comms. Like, it's useless perk. And if you're solo queuing, normally it doesn't really matter unless you're actively trying to avoid them or you're tr- just trying to co- co-op or you- you're just you- well that's basically it you're just trying to find out your teammates positions so you can play better but in those scenarios like the better perk is kindred maybe kindred. what you could do with bond is kind of like how kindred works where if another survivor is running at you they see your aura but not everyone else's and if you're running at them obviously you'll see all three mm. kind of thing so, so like all the other survivors will be able to see you. But more passive. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't mind that. What do you guys think about so like you know how if nobody runs an obsession for no obsession spawns? Do you guys think an obsession should always spawn in the matches? Yes. yes. I even yeah. have an idea for it where <laughs> my idea for that is so you know how every uh, killer has an associated survivor for the most part, apart from like a select few. My idea is that I think that the survivor that comes to the killer should have a higher chance of being the obsession if that killer is in place. So say that you uh, have a Blight, and you have an Adam, a Felix, a Dwight, and a Yui. So because Felix is the survivor who came out with Blight, Felix would have a higher chance of becoming the obsession. And so would it only be higher chance, or would it be 100%? Because then if you get into that you know, situation... It's like some killer. It's like a stealth killer. Yeah. Like, uh, some... like, who came out with Pig? Uh, I don't have. But there's still one minor issue with that, and that, and that's the original killers. I would say, and the standalone killers. Well, I guess what like, I guess like if it was just only an increased chance, that would make sense. But I feel like that would give information. Like if it was Felix, was the obsession. It's like okay, well, this could be a blight already, or if Tap, it's like okay, this might be a pig. So like. You know. There's, I, but I used there's to also... say this thing too, 
let's say if that slight increase in chance, right? Let's just talk about DS without having it in great detail. It has an increased chance of you becoming the obsession. And if you are having one guy with DS and one other, and then you also have on base on top of that increased chance of becoming the obsession, it's kind of easy to figure out who has the perk because there's a higher chance that the person who's the obsession has the perk because of the character that has been chosen. More conditions that allow you to narrow it down. Basically. That is a good I kind of wonder if it would be a good idea, because like with the obsession, like whenever I'm playing solo queue, uh, if like the obsession is being chased, that's a nice bit of info. So like I know that the the killer is preoccupied, and I don't really have to worry that much. I wonder if it'd be a good idea to like you know how the like, character portraits they change if somebody gets injured or gets slugged. I wonder if it'd be good if the character portrait's changing like when they're in chase with the killer, to where it's like a like a running symbol instead of just like the normal like portrait. I wonder if that'd be good information for solo queues. I think um, it would be because that's that's somewhere. easily communicatable. So I think that would be really good because now you yeah. know, say that for whatever reason they don't make kindred baseline. So what you could then do is you could know, all right, there's one person who's on the hook, and my other teammate's being chased, and I clearly see that the other teammate's on a generator. All right, I guess I'll just go save because now you know that's the only logical choice because your other teammates clearly cannot make the save. It reminds me of what they did with uh, Victor. When someone has Victor on them, they has like hands going around them and the animation, so people can actually know that you know what's happening. It's really nice. I do like that implementation of uh, when he's on your back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe another idea is that so instead of changing the icon to a running symbol. What if it displayed, like, um, you know how Distressing and, uh, and uh, Dark Devotion have, like, those lines to, uh, to, like, reference the terrorists, right? What if that was the sign that someone's in a chase, where it pops up on, on them, so that means that they're in a chase currently? I would like that. I think any, any yeah. kind of information of, of who's getting chased. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, maybe, like, a uh, another, uh, well, actually, I, I guess we wouldn't have to do it for generators, because I, I feel like that's just a given. Hopefully. <laughs> You'd hope. <Yeah. laughs> I feel like, on one hand, it'd have the potential to be really nice to know, and on the other hand, it's like, alright, what are these blendits doing? And they just don't do anything for, like, five minutes. It's like, alright, I guess I know how to end the game already. I wonder if that would, like, if people would, like, be conditioned to actually start doing generators then, because then they'd feel guilty, because everybody knows that they're not doing anything. <laughs> Maybe. Good. We could start having, like, a, uh, a shaming, uh... We could just start doing the shame game. Let's add a totem icon, too, when someone's doing totems. Yeah. More information that is easily communicable by, uh, being a, uh, comm. Yeah. They really need to add in a sound because, like, there's the crashing sound whenever a hex totem gets cleansed. They really need to add in a sound when all the totems get cleansed, like just something to indicate that all of them have been cleansed. Because, like, when you're in solo queue, you kind of have to count all the totems that are being done. And if one of your teammates does a totem, then like you don't know that. I I had a suggestion a long time ago, and that was just make it to, like small game, a perk that is basically useless compared to everything else. You just have like a totem counter. Yeah. Like something similar to that, yeah. but m more like less baseline. I think that there should be a uh, a visual effect because there are some people who play the game that uh, either have impaired hearing or they just can't hear at all. Which, granted, it can be hard to tell the difference because the sounds don't work half the time. But there are some people who legitimately uh, cannot hear very well. So I feel like having a visual effect is like you can pretty much guarantee that everybody will know when a generator is not a generator when all the totems are done because. You get that indication with generators, so I think a totem counter would probably be a better idea, although I do like both ideas in general. I just think that one would benefit a larger uh, group of players. Mm -hmm. I mean, we already have a generator counter, we should just have a totem counter next to it. Just goes yeah. down. Yeah. 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 Alright, so are we happy with uh, totems so far? I have a topic, since we're talking about mm -hmm. game mechanics. Let's talk about bloodlust. Uh, 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 <laughs> since we're every update <clears throat> and i know i'm a survivor main so i kind of want like also the killers perspectives on this as well um 
every loop is being reduced to like you can you can loop around it once and then you're probably gonna have to throw the pallet um you throw it they respect the pallet and they just run around it and then blood lets you to tier three then down you yeah. like i don't like unsafe pallets i like semi-safe pallets because that's where you can make the plays but the depth form of semi-safe is still unsafe Mm -hmm. especially with bloodless as a mechanic because like oh no i didn't catch up to him this time let's just hold w a little bit harder yeah it's like it's like they should have to either do a good mind game or break the pallet yeah i know um, I'm a... but i kind of want you guys go ahead one thing i've noticed from every update is like <laughs> i've started running life a lot more i feel like life is becoming a lot meta like more meta essentially because loops are getting shorter so if you throw the pallet you can always mind game vault it and get away to like another safe pallet and they also took away the fence on Badham for a little bit there, which was so bad. Um, if you didn't have light there, you're getting hit. But they ended up putting that back. So I'm just noticing like some life is sort of becoming better. Because you can kind of use it on command, semi. Yeah. Command. yeah. It's because it's getting more use now. Like it always had the same amount of use, but the value of it's going up because of uh, how the pallets are placed. Now, yeah. one thing I will say is that. I've said this time and time again, where one of my favorite maps in this game personally is Temple of Purgation. Now, not for the map size, not for the building, but because it has a good mix of the pallets where you have safe pallets and you have playable ones where you can still play the pallet after it's been dropped. So it has a good mixture to where if the killer does start bloodlusting you, you at least have a couple of safe pallets you can go to, but yet not every pallet is super safe like... um. I'm going to call those obtuse stone walls because like, it's like very similar to the uh, Crotus Prince Asylum pallet where you have these two obtuse walls with a pallet in between them. And that's playable when it's dropped, but it's also like you're not guaranteed to get hit there either. And then another example would be, let's say, the short stone pallets. Like, it's like a, uh, it's almost, I don't remember the uh, color of the stone, but it's like a very low to the ground stone with another uh, wall that is the same exact way on the other side, but except it has a it has a higher wall at the very end. So I feel like that's also another nice pallet because you're not guaranteed to get hit there, but at the same time, you just have a good mixture in general. And then you also have your really safe tiles, like the maze tiles, the shack, and then for whatever reason, you just have the garbage pile in the basement of, uh, of Temple of Precation. You wonder why that exists. <laughs> and yeah, I, that is like the least safe. But but hey, it's fine. If you pop the generator, you get a safe pallet. Yeah, that's good. And a chest. I yeah, actually chest. like that idea where like you kind of get rewarded for the fact that you did a generator, so you're actually doing your objective. And you kind of open up more resources by doing that. I feel like that was a really unique idea, and I don't understand how they haven't done that with any other map yet. It's on the swamp too. I also, I also like Temple Application, but not for the same reason as you, and that's because there's it's the only map with four chests as a base. Oh yeah, I mean, that's actually, right. Quite a four few one. maps do that. The game does that too, where walls open or like doors open. Mainly thinking about the game, then. Yeah, but the game is like I feel like nobody likes getting meat plant. Yeah, no, no. one does. Doesn't uh, Hawkins has doors that open too, right? Or am I? Uh, yes. Stupid. Yeah. Yeah. And then Hawk the pantry has like the two story building that the doors will open and the main building opens. Yeah, like there's a few interactions, but not all of them open up new loops though necessarily. I feel like Temple is the only one where when you do a generator, it actually unlocks a new pallet altogether. Yeah. Yeah. Like how would you feel That's if like more maps utilize that? Like nothing too insane, but like just you know, oh, you did a generator. It opens up like one new pallet here. Well, I know. Oh, at man. least I know a Meg wouldn't have thrown it yet, so True. I yeah. can get there. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> I do like that idea as well. Um, I don't know. I I still think that like bloodlust should be removed with how they're making loops. Maybe like once after this, like all these maps are done being reworked and stuff. Maybe look at that, because I know there are some yeah. still strong loops, So I don't, but... it shouldn't necessarily be removed, but cap it at one. Yeah, basically. Maybe. Yeah, like, what I would say is... Pre-DVD days were bad. Like, like early <laughs> DVD days. Well, yeah, but I mean, but... if they're going to make every loop so short that you can't really run around it, 
But then you get the strong loops. I'm a survivor main too. I don't think it should be taken away. Because if you get a strong loop, you're running that. You can shift tech shack all day. It won't ever block. If the killer chases incorrectly, yeah. 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 But no, I mean, that's, just, that's just the killer chasing incorrectly. Like, if they learn how to do it, I'm sure some... I mean, how often do you guys really go into Bloodlust? Like, I'm talking to the killer mains. Okay, uh, so... How often do you go to Bloodlust 3? Like... Never. The, almost never. Almost never. <laughs> Bloodlust exactly. 3? Never. Never. I would have like, to literally chase them. Do you go to Bloodlust 2? Uh, Very I guess it's a really um, good survivor. Yeah. I, Bloodlust 2, if they're, like, really good at mind game, like a semi-safe pilot, let's say, um... Let's say I already have like Bloodless One and I get to Bantam Preschool's car pallet with the occasional hook. Yeah. Like that, I can occasionally get like Bloodless Two, but normally I never get Bloodless Three because it's either a. But it's hit it's rare, right? It's, it's rare. A, it's, yeah. yeah. Okay. One thing I will say is that um, if anything, the only times I've really gotten to Bloodless Two is either A, it's an extremely good survivor, or B, they just held down W for so long that by the time I actually <laughs> caught up to them, I got <laughs> Bloodless One and I still had to play the pallet. <laughs> like Aaron started that meta. Nice literally player. just like yep. slamming their face onto the W key until it bleeds. I mean, I, I think the working. easiest, <laughs> I, I think the easiest like patch for Bloodlust would just be to make it to where if the killer swings at all, it resets their Bloodlust. I'd like be down. That. Yeah. Yeah. I still think Bloodlust three should be removed. Maybe yep. not the entirety of Bloodlust, but I do like the if you swing and miss. Out. Yeah, I also love the scenarios where you're like, "Yeah, I'm I'm a looping this guy for ages. There's no way he's catching me." Oh yeah, bloodlust. Yeah, exactly. Or you can tell when you're about to make a window, and then you get pokos through it because they got bloodlust right as you vaulted it. And yeah. one thing I'll actually <clears throat> say is, um, I've actually had some chases where I've actually gotten someone maybe like two seconds after I got bloodlust, but I know damn well that the only reason why I got that hit. And that the chase ended right then and there is because Bloodless gave me just enough distance to where I got the hit. It's not because I'm misplaying, but you know, as I mentioned before, you get into that one chase where someone holds down W, and then you finally catch up to them, you get Bloodless, and by the time you're actually at the loop, you just gain just enough speed to where you just shut it down anyways. And it's like, well, I know exactly why I got the hit. I feel like, you know, that chase could have gone for longer had I not gotten Bloodless right then and there. Yeah, I definitely yeah. notice that too when I play killer. Like I'll be getting hits that I shouldn't have, so getting bloodlust yeah. in the perfect time. And well, that's when you say we matters. take those. I play Oni, so I get those. hits that I shouldn't. All the... <laughs> I get hits that I shouldn't get all the time. Like there's so many cases where someone will drop a pallet, I'll get stunned, and I still hit them through it because for whatever reason Oni's hitbox is very weird with pallets. It's weird in general. I feel. Yeah, mm. it's like a brick wall. Focus. Yes. <laughs> I play Huntress, so I know all about the uh, Poco's hits with the hatchets. I play a lot of Nurse nowadays, so I also know a bit of Poco's. A bit, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all had our experiences. So, another thing, though, is... When it comes to, like, Bloodlust, I also feel like, you know, it also teaches a very bad habit. So, like, not only is it making it unfun for the survivor because they can't really loop at the pallet they're at anymore because, well, I guess on the bright side, they're guaranteeing that they're saving their team 45 seconds worth of time for the killer makes it to Bloodlust 3. But the thing about it is that it teaches the killer a very bad habit as well, where it's like, you get a new status effect and you suddenly think, wow, that's actually a good thing because I feel faster. That must be... That must be good. Like, they get that indication where, like, uh, they feel like they're doing something right. And I think because of that, it teaches killers a bad habit and makes them rely on Bloodlust as opposed to rewarding them for actually doing well in a chase. And I agree, because, like, they'll be like, okay, I'm just going to walk around this pallet because I can. I'm, you know, moving at mock speeds right now. <laughs> and then they lose and they get upset about that because, like, you know, they got Bloodlust 3 several times in one game and it's like, well, shit, I still lost, so this is unbalanced as hell, when in reality, the game is just giving them a false idea of what they are doing right and what they're doing wrong. I agree. And then I think it would, if you can, if like, say like they had that, though, and they combined it with removing a stack, it would probably teach them, hopefully, to just break, when, like, when to break a pallet and when to not. You know? Yeah. Like, I don't know, I feel like Bloodless as a mechanic is very flawed. Like, it made 
I mean, it didn't even make sense at the time where they added it, because let's be honest, if you're chasing someone to serve ward, you shouldn't be doing that anyways, and Blella still doesn't help because if you're at a building that, that, that is that safe, you're not going to catch them anyways. The winners are just simply too good in those uh, buildings, like, you know, Disturbed Ward, House of Pain on both Haddonfield and on Badham, although I'll argue that the one on Badham is significantly stronger due to the window placements in comparison to where the doors are. So I would say that certain like Bantam tiles is even stronger than House of Pain because like well mo both of them being House of Pain technically but it, the the doors that are just blocked and then there's like window right beside them I don't think they should exist because the killer has to either force the vault okay cool I cannot vault the window again oh he lost chase time to shift tech lol or they just break the uh, the break up a wall which is basically forced I don't like the mechanic of forcing walls to get broken to win my chase and that's actually mm -hmm. another thing so I feel like behavior has been wanting to add in new mechanics which is you know they did this with the uh, entity blocker on generators, so, you know, they made a bunch of perks around that. But when it comes to, like, you know, the chase, the chases remained relatively untouched outside of killer powers. And I feel like with Break of Walls, they really want to add in something new. But I feel like part of me feels like based on the way they've been implementing them, which is, you know, to re-add in infinite windows, but, you know, it's okay because you break the wall even though I feel like it removes a lot of skill from the game. It makes me feel like they don't really understand what people really like in a chase. Like, I think they understand their chase mechanics well, but I don't think they understand what people are actually looking for in this game when they are being chased. Did you guys ever play Resident Evil 7 when you're coming no. out of the hallway? Yeah. And the guy, like, bursts through the wall and just, like, it's like a jump scare? I feel like that's what breakable walls should have been. But they're just more of a time waster for the killer when there's already complaints about. You know, like gen speeds and stuff. So what yeah. you're saying is you want like stealth killers, for example, just to hop through a fucking wall and then just slap someone. No, not necessarily. I just I'm saying like what I think what people within their heads thought breakable walls was gonna be, and then what we got. I do think breakable walls should be able to be destroyed with an M1 because it's already wasting the killer's time. So there's no point they should have to kick it. I think they she should be able to walk through it. it. Like they're already like monstrous in strength. Like, True. why can't you just, like, just ram through the entire body without wasting a single second? Yeah. Bro. That you would can, be like, kind of cool if they could, like, M1 through it. Like, M1 at the yeah. start and then continue the lunge through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, you that'd like, be so badass on Oni. Well. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know if you guys ever played with low pro trains with uh, breakable walls. That's on so uh, Midwich, I've broke through a wall with low pro trains and then continued on and hit somebody on the other side. And like, that was the most fun <laughs> moment that I've ever had with low pro. Dude. And like, I just wish that was like a base thing. Dead Dog Saloon, oh, chaining, the, chaining the pallets just to break a wall and then chain from the wall to the next wall. That oh. is super fun. Like you get rid of the entire map. The like, one <laughs> I, so so fun. That. I just thought the dumbest idea. Victor can pounce at walls, but doing so will kill him and break the wall. Really? Mm. Yeah, oh, wait, you're saying this is a, as an idea. Oh, I no, like no, it's a joke. A it's a joke. Oh. <laughs> I mean, he's already weak as it is, man. Let him, <laughs> let him, let him hop through the wall. <laughs> just, he just dies in the process. Can already just my pop way. in a locker. That's also one thing I don't understand about Victor. It's why he dies on, like, loops that are above normal playing area. I don't understand that at all. I think it's funny when you, uh head on them and he just disintegrates <laughs> <laughs> or you use palace and he flies away on the killer screen yep <laughs> i'm just waiting for people to figure out how to do space victor <laughs> yes <laughs> that's me when i kick him <laughs> <laughs> he's about to see the stars <laughs> He's about to become the thing that he's made of. Yep. But, um... I feel like, you know, breakable walls are just such a huge miss when it comes to the game, because, like, they clearly want to have more mechanics in the game, and, you know, the chase is the most fun part of the game, but do any of you feel like they just don't understand what people find fun in a chase? Well, the devs are more about statistic than uh, feedback, in my opinion. 
Yeah, uh, and yeah. if they follow their okay. own statistics, Nurse is the worst killer, even though she's literally the yeah. best. Yeah, e even with their statistics, how they collect statistics is so weird because, like, they talked about the kill rate and everything, and how, like, oh, these killers are, like, these maps are performing well because they have a good kill rate. But, like, as killer, I can force somebody into second state on, like, Mother's Dwelling with no perks and be able to 4K like that by just, like, kind of forcing the second state on everybody. That doesn't mean that it's a good map for killer or, like, I played well or anything like that. I just played scummy. And so I think the devs need to, like, go away from, like, oh, these killers are getting kills, so it's a good map. And it's more so focused on, like, the amount of hook states that's happened. That's actually an idea states, I had. Like, total amount of hooks. Yeah, like, that's actually an idea I had because, like, uh... I feel like, you know, the ideal match is that the killer gets, like, you know, eight unique hooks, because what does this translate to? Well, it can mean a bunch of different scenarios. So, for instance, either everybody died, or in another case, everybody got hooked twice, nobody dies, or in the most balanced scenario, two people die, and you got a couple of extra hooks as well. So, suddenly, you have this, uh, you have, like, this, uh, idea that it's not just the kills, it's about how many times you got to be in a chase and won that chase as well. So, it focuses on the fact that you didn't just squeeze in a kill at the last second, you actually got to play the game throughout the entire match, and I feel like that would be a way better system. Mm -hmm. And it'd be better for them to bounce their game around that, to where if like there's a certain map where people are getting kills, but they're not getting that many hooks, then like, obviously they're having to play in an unfun way, and they can bounce the map around that. Exactly. And from that we could see, alright, did the killer have to play scummier, or did they play nicer in order to get their wins on this game? Now granted, I will still have to acknowledge that there's a lot of players on both sides that aren't necessarily the greatest. And so I feel like, you know, it will still skew results a lot, but I think it would be a more accurate result than just kills. Because I mean, half the time, if you just face camp someone, they're all gonna run in for the save anyways, and they'll also all die as well. Yeah, and also one thing that's kind of skewed with the uh, with the res or with the statistics on kills is like killers like Freddy have really high stats for kills, but I know so many people that as soon as they see it's a Freddy, they just kill themselves on hook, and so they're contributing to the stats to say like Freddy's the best killer in the game because like everybody just kills themselves on hook. In reality, the the whole thing about him is that he's just most boring to go against. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just like mm -hmm. Pyramid Head a little bit more, but that's a different topic for a different day. <laughs> but, um, like, yeah, like, not everybody wants to go against those kind of killers, and so I feel like that also skews the uh, kill rates. And, like, for instance, Pig, she has one of the highest kill rates in the game, but yet, I feel like her power isn't actually that good. I think what people do is they just put on Tamper Timer, and then they put on, like, you know, Crate of Gears, or you know what? Maybe they don't even have tamper, tamper Timer. Maybe they just have Bag and Create Gears and they just force the head pop because it takes so long and they get like a large map and that kind of influences it. So like, I feel like, you know, it's just people stacking down slowdowns or they're just forcing the uh, game to be played in a certain way because they brought in the add-ons for it. I'm pretty sure more sort of counted for the killer rates too. Right? I would hope Are not. They? Like, logically, that would make sense, because they don't have a separate category, that at least what they've shown does. So it should contribute to the kills, too. But it's indicated by a different icon. Yeah, so I feel like they still, at least keep track of it. That, yeah, they should, but it still counts as a kill, technically, so... Yeah, because, like, what Card is talking about, like, in the archives, if you get a challenge for, like, ten kill ten people, you can either mori ten people, or you can just kill them on hook. Gotcha. So they, they probably count it as the same stat. There's a good chance that, that could be the case, honestly, and that would concern me because uh, there's been a lot of Moris lately. Yep. <clears throat> so, you know, um, I think that would be a better metric to uh, judge the uh, game by because that way it goes back to, you know, what everyone wants to do. Everybody wants to have fun in this game, but you see, you don't know what to change or what should even be changed in the first place if the results you're getting and, like, you know, the stats you're getting aren't even the best that they could be. That's all I have to say there. Mm -hmm. And it kind of helps the community to give feedback whenever they give, like, accurate stats. 
because like that contributes to like oh like the things that i'm seeing like may actually be the case or the things that i'm seeing may not actually be the case it might just be my small anecdotal evidence like when you see like hard stats like that like if they're actually like good stats then it can help like with giving opinions on where the game should go yeah i definitely agree with that So do you have anything else to add on to this? Uh, no, I don't think so. Anybody else? Not on stats. Like, I love looking at stats, but that's the issue too. It's the num the numbers can be so easily fluctuated. Yeah. Definitely. Well, here's another idea. So, well, not an idea. Here's another uh, discussion. So, if they were to add in a new mechanic, for like the chases, would any of you even add anything? Because this is something I can't really think of myself because I feel like, you know, this is like one of the few things I can't really think outside of the box on. So I want to know if you guys thought of like any ideas that Behavior could use to actually make chases more interesting and to change up the recipe a little bit while keeping the idea very much so the same. Uh, we get three hits for me to go down. <laughs> Just run Metal of Man. Old Metal of Man. <laughs> Yeah, old metal man with Diaz adrenaline. Come now. Mm -hmm. Old metal of man. Oh my god, those were the days. So <laughs> broken. I saw one idea that was floating around where people are saying you you should be able to enter a long animation for breakable walls to rest survivor. You can turn it into a vault. Oh yeah, uh, space actually brought mm -hmm. up an idea where like um you would have like breakable vaults uh on the mm -hmm. previous podcast. It's so like, you know, whether or not they would be built or, like, natural, I think it would be more interesting because, you know, maybe the killer would be able to vault it a little bit faster, but they would also have the option to actually break it, which would be the more efficient option mm -hmm. in the long I run. Think with, I think if they're going to keep both those in, though, like, breakable walls and then breakable vaults, and, uh, I feel like, you can re, like, reoccurringly, you know, build these vaults back up, maybe make it to where killers can just walk through it, like we were talking about earlier, so, like, it doesn't take them any more time. Yes, it's making the survivors do something else, but like... I also wouldn't mind if survivors could actually like spend like, well, let's say 10 seconds or something and just create a breakable wall, window vault that can be breaking, broken by the killer too. Mm -hmm. And then you yeah. just remove it entirely. Like, that like, would while... be so much fun. Yeah, because like while you're, you're spending time away from generators doing that, like it could help out with the chase and like vice versa, like you doing that and like trying to make better chases may actually like sandbag your team. So like it it wouldn't just be like weighed one side or the other, like it, in terms of like it being like overpowered, like it could either really benefit or like really hinder your mm -hmm. team, depending on how you do it. Yeah. And it can just be gone in a matter of seconds because the killer can just break it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would just be more interesting as well because that would open up actually more plays that could be made. Versus breakable walls, which are just, you know, they're pre drop pallets that nobody can interact with until they're destroyed. Yeah. Alright, so do we have anything else that we could possibly add in as new mechanics if there were to be any new ones at all? I thought I could think of. Well, I think Make we're good it. there then. I just want the ability to drop some virus while in the air. <laughs> <laughs> like, why do I have to be on the floor to drop them? I'd take it. Well, I guess that covers, like, you know, game mechanics there. Unless, uh, wait, no, there's actually another idea that I had. So, when it comes to, like, uh, chess as well, I feel like, you know, they've been trying to put more emphasis on chess in the game. Because, like, you know, the PTB, they had, like, Hoarder, they had that reroll perk for the chest. And so, what I wanted to think of is, is there any ideas that we could have for chess to be more interesting in the game? For instance, one idea that I had is that, let's say you're playing killer, right? And you defended your chest, and there's, like, a few that were left over at the end of the trial. As an idea, depending on the amount of chests that were left unlooted, the killer could get an add-on, and that add-on could be of a higher rarity based on the amount of chests that were left alone. And, you know, you could maybe tie some emblem scores to it, or even, like, some blood point scores to it, and you can make chests a more, uh, competed area of the game. Like, it's a more competitive spot. 
So what you're saying is that you want basement protector Bubba? <laughs> yes. God, that'd be for... so funny to watching a killer loot a chest. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, I, I found my I flashlight. I don't just... mind that idea, though. Like, you protect a secondary objective and you get secondary add-ons. Exactly. It's like, you know, let's say that you're playing Bubba, okay? Because why not? You're playing Bubba. You defended your chest, and your reward is that you get chili. Human chili. Hmm. I'm just uh, as as that. excited for Insidious, Hoarder, Franklin's. Oh, Dude. Oh, give, give us a benefit. Let's make... Give, give us add-ons for every item with this word Franklin's, please. <laughs> <laughs> and Hoarder applies to any drop items as well, where if they pick it up, they uh they do the yeah. loud notice. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be a very fun combo. But, you know, I think... It would make the game more interesting because, like, now all of a sudden, you're not just competing for generators to get out, but, you know, maybe you don't want that killer to get that ad that add-on, or, you know what, maybe as a survivor, you want those bonus points for getting all the chests. So suddenly, you have more reason to interact with more things in the game. Like, if you're, like, in a group or whatnot, what reason do you really have to go for, for chests other than, you know, screwing around? You don't really get a whole lot of points for it, and... If you're in a group already, you don't have much of a reason to actually go for chests because you already have all the power that you need. Or, you know, as a solo, you don't really have the, uh, you don't really see the value in it because there's more important things to do. Like, you gotta get the gens done because you can't guarantee your teammates are gonna do them. But yet, if you as a team end up getting all the chests and, you know, because you get all the chests, you get, like, a nice, uh, amount of bonus BP, all of a sudden, there's, like, something else to, uh, play around. And I feel like, you know, it would be like a short-term reward where you get that short-term satisfaction that you got something done that you didn't have to sit through maybe a 20-minute game for. Or I would hope that matches would never go on for that long, but you get the idea. Have you seen Freddy tournament games? Yeah, <laughs> I fell asleep to them. How do you think I felt when I had to deal with a 6th gen? <laughs> <laughs> Funny story, I had a getting meat plant that uh, had all seven generators on the bottom floor when I was playing Nurse. They didn't get a gen done, because the generators were just way too close. So you may have heard of six, uh, six gen setup, but have you heard of the seven gen setup? I've never seen one, I would love to. It's only happened to me once, and that was like, uh, maybe about a year ago or so. I'm sure something just bugged out and that's not even supposed to happen, but it was kind of crazy that it even had the possibility of happening. Yeah. RNG be like. <laughs> we love RNG. Yes, sir. Give me that broken toolbox every game. <laughs> Dude, give me that uh, long wall in the shack on Chapel or... Uh, what's the other map? Sanctum of Wrath. No, no, no. Let me one-up you. On Couch, give me those LT walls linking to the C walls. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yep. Or you know, um, as pig, give me those first, uh, give me those first box removals on everybody. But no, like I feel like RNG is it's kind of really bad for this game, honestly. Like I think that there are some elements of it that are good, like you know, map selection, but RNG definitely has the power to ruin a lot of matches as well. That Sony and Blonde Legend in Tar Middle, for example? Or Gas Heaven. Gas Heaven has the best <laughs> example of a map that changes RNG. It could either be one of the most balanced maps in the game, or it could be super killer side, or it could be one of the most survivor side uh, maps. Well, not Some literally, but. Too. Right. Yeah, it can spawn like two pallets or 20. Yeah. I feel like all the auto havens yeah, are like that cool. in a way, except yeah. for Red Shop. I feel like Red Shop is always dead, but every other auto haven is just so RNG dependent. Like I love auto haven, but RNG could really make or break that map, or realm, I should say. Mm. So, is there any other uh, things we'd like to bring up for mechanics? Uh... No, I don't think so. Unless yeah, anybody else really. has anything. Not really. 
All right. That's what you can think of. Well, that does bring me to our final topic, which, uh, Trick, uh, sorry, Trickster, I think you wanted to uh, bring this up on the previous podcast, but you couldn't make it before. So I remember you wanted to talk about toxicity in the community, but, you know, it didn't really feel right to bring up the uh, topic while you weren't here. So what I wanted to know is, did you want to talk about that tonight, or did you want to maybe say that for another night? I'll leave that one up to you, because it didn't feel right to talk about it while you weren't around. Oh, uh, yeah, we can talk about it. So, I, I, I honestly think, and I think this just goes into, uh, like, even, like, streamers and everything, that, like, the toxicity in DBD, like, it's pretty prevalent, just especially because there's very much so, like, a us versus them mentality with a lot of people. <laughs> To where like they'll see like something happen and they just like only play survivor only play killer and they'll just think that somebody's being super toxic when that's not the case and then i think with streamers a lot of streamers perpetuate that kind of toxicity and it's very weird in my opinion especially when streamers kind of perpetuate that type of stuff when they don't have like a nuanced opinion about the game because if you are like just trying to be a toxic piece of shit to like all survivors or like all killers you're kind of alienating your own viewer base and uh, I don't know if you guys saw the clip. I posted a clip a few days ago, I think. Like, yeah, I saw it. Yeah, yeah was it? I was like the dude was the, being uh, an asshole. Yeah. yeah. And the that's not something... Yeah, yeah, that's not something that's very rare either. Because I've seen many big streamers as well like do similar things to that. And I just... I don't know how it feels. Because I feel like that type of stuff trickles down to like every part of the community. And that, that kind of stuff makes it to where like the game is more unbearable. Because one thing, get... yeah. One thing I want to know is, Will, what would you consider toxic in DVD? Like we uh, we obviously know T-bag, like in game chat, chat <laughs> and like what that Dust Singer did, but like, <laughs> would you consider in game actions like such as flashlight clicking and teabagging to be like toxic? Personally, the only... no. Oh, sorry. Personally, the only things I think are toxic in the game are determined by the things that you say in the end game chat. Or purposely exploiting, you know, a game-changing bug to your own advantage. Because most in-game actions, you don't really get context. So, like, for instance, for survivors, sometimes they do that as in, oh, ha, I outplayed you. Like, it's the only way they can communicate that. Whereas, you know, you don't really get that context as killer. But, you know, when you uh, get to the end-game chat, or let's say they're actually abusing a bug that you can't really do anything about, those are the only actions where it's like, all right, clearly that person is just being a dick at that point, and you have all the context you need in that scenario. Yeah. Recent hook I also tech. think holding the game hostage is pretty, uh, pretty toxic. Mm, like just dragging the game over longer than necessary. Yeah. yeah. I think that's possibly to be toxic, but it depends on the context, right? Because like, if it's someone who's just picked up the game for like, you know, maybe their tenth match ever, then they may not understand what they're doing is wrong. Whereas, you know, if it's someone who has, like, you know, hundreds of hours, they clearly know what taking the game hostage is, and you know what, maybe they've been part of a match where that happened, then I would deem that to be toxic as well, yeah, because you're just wasting everybody's time at that point. Yeah, just, like, I really wish they would they would make it where you could DC without getting a penalty if, like, say, like, you played, like, three to five minutes of the game... If you DC after that, like you're not ruining the survivor's experience so much. I mean, it's all it's a case by case, but like at a certain point you should be able to DC. So if someone does slug you and they're trying to bleed you out, and I've had this happen multiple times on my stream recently, where killers get up- upset that I looped them well and they down me finally and they just bleed me out because I'm the last one. That is toxic. And it's just it's just annoying because it's like I already want to I already want to GG. It's fine. You killed me. Whatever. Just let me. You know, just hook me or something. Like. But they want to they want to sit there and let me bleed out or they'll the wait till like the the bar is like one yeah. second left and they pick you up <laughs> yeah i was gonna say that it's like you just wasted my time and yours i feel well, like they that's think, pretty toxic too uh, they think they're really doing something too i'm just like laughing half the time i just pull up words on stream and just talk to the chat <laughs> dude my favorite thing ever is um i'll just run like the dumbest build possible and then like uh for instance one of the builds that i ran was uh tinkerer mindbreaker no not not mindbreaker it was the other demigorgon perk tinkerer cruel limits bitter murmur and barbecue and i got to- i got called toxic because i slugged all four of them when they're all running at me and it's like all right am i being sweaty or toxic because i'm running cruel limits that that must be a really sweaty perk obviously cruel limits op really competitive perk you know yeah 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 
Same with Bitter Murmur. <laughs> Bitter Murmur is super fun, especially on Huntress. Fun, Dude, yes. I, get, I use an all aura build and have been told that I'm, you know, that I'm lacking? using OP perks. Oh. Barbecue and They're cheater. Like, oh, you can see, yeah, barbecue and <laughs> cheater. <laughs> Bitter attitude. <laughs> get out of here all these like i just use all aura perks and people would be like use those wow he's a real perk like monstrous shrine like okay <laughs> now nah, i'll stick to my um to my whispers thank you very much while on that side uh conversation of monster shrine it has a negative chance uh, well reduces your chances to cope in basement right have you guys ever um, played Basement Bubba in Monster Shrine and had someone Kobe with negative luck? <laughs> <laughs> Twice. <laughs> oh, that reminds me of that one video uh, where Ots was like, all right, they, they cannot Kobe, I'm getting the 4K, because he had, like, Monster Shrine, and then he's Kobe in his face right as he said that. <laughs> <laughs> Funny shit ever. I wouldn't be surprised if, like, DVD was coded in a way to where if somebody has, like, enough negative luck, it just goes to the complete other side, and now they have, like, <laughs> 100% percent right back to around. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's a bug that I could 100% see being in the game. I think that would be a bug as well. Like, that's definitely a possibility. And, like, he Kobe's into a health state. <laughs> God, like those hackers, they Kobe and they're at the exit gate now. <laughs> oh my God, we should talk about that. <laughs> that was that was a that streamer. Yeah, I won't say their name, but <laughs> yeah, me neither. That was uh, that was something. I definitely know who you're referencing, though. I feel like everyone everyone here was there. does because everybody was there. Everybody in the entire DB community, I feel like, was there <laughs> for the most. Where part. were you when the hacker man did a stream, stream for eight hours? Oh, yeah. How long ago? It's like a how week ago. ago. Like a week ago. Yeah. He was just blatantly uh, hacking, doing like different killers with like machine gun hatchets. Yeah, he was playing like Ghostface and flying around the map and just having <laughs> infinite machine gun hatchets. And then like he could like pick you up in a second and you'd already be thrown on a hook. Then he also played Survivor, and if every time the mm. uh, killer would hit him. I remember one on. like super fun thing. It was like one behavior dev was actually watching the stream too. Wait, the, there was a behavior dev in the stream? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I I looked up like the Steam ID and stuff a couple days later and they, yeah, they were banned. Oh. He's actually done a few streams after that and usually gets <laughs> banned within 30 minutes. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. The one the day after he did another one and um Literally, 30 minutes in, he's already banned. So I but think, I, I but think I have think, a tab on him now. I, th but I think cheating like that is kind of toxic. Like, it just yeah. straight up ruined experience for everyone. Just well, of course. Tell like... your friends if you want to do it. Like, whatever. Just go fuck around there. Like, don't ruin people's experiences. Yeah, so I guess, you know, things like that can also be toxic. But I don't think there's, like, you know, very many normal, assuming the game is actually completely and totally functional. I don't think there's very many normal gameplay uh interactions that are actually toxic well, yeah no, i think it's more like outside of the game how people treat each other yeah. like whether yeah. it be like in game chat or whether it be like how streamers uh interact with players that are in the game because like pretty much most people i would say like more than 90 percent of people will have like gone against a streamer and the streamer just like shits on them for like no reason yeah and like that that doesn't feel good to go against and then like people see that kind of behavior and they it just kind of gets normalized where everybody's just like shitting on everybody for no reason and just makes the community worse i've had it happen to me a lot me you. but like <laughs> i i know why they shit talk me so i don't like i don't take offense to it like i i know who the fuck i am i know that <laughs> i'm not liked so i'm just gonna take the shit and move on like it's normal i like you card clasher <laughs> no homo though, right? Not right. after I got hit out of my sprint burst. I don't know. Blew <laughs> my sprint burst, bro. So, so what? What can we do about like you know improving the overall, I guess, atmosphere of the community where like we can actually make it so they don't hate each other as much? Because I do know that uh one thing that has such a big role in this is the fact that the community is very divided. You got killer players, you got survivor players, and 
because you have these two sides, I feel like, you know, a lot of it stems from that where, like, because you have these two sides, you have people, and a lot of people of that, who just don't understand the problems of the other side that they're playing against. They don't understand that they, as a player, are going against other human beings who are also playing the game. They're not playing against robots, even though we would like to think that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's true. I think it's really hard to make it to where people don't hate each other after a game because, you know, it, one side is trying to take from the other and vice versa. Mm. So it makes it really hard for, like, a like you know, someone new coming in, like you said, who doesn't really, maybe doesn't play the other side very well. It, I think it's pretty easy for them to get upset about it in a game like this, you know? It, it, like, it's the win lose mentality. Like, you win, I, uh, you lose. Like, yeah. But only one lose. side can win no, both sides can't win and that's yeah. where the toxicity issue comes from yeah. yep. well I think that both sides uh, can't win the same game I think both sides can have fun in the same game which well, would yeah, be a healthy way to look at yeah. it rarely but yeah yeah I, I did kind of forget that DB is kind of the stomp or be stomped kind of game mm, yeah yeah I think the issue is just that, like, when you speak about fun, fun is very subjective. Like, um, like recently, I kind of reworked how I think of this game because, like, focusing on escaping was just making me miserable. And I was like, I'm just going to focus on getting better at chases and having fun and not taking this game too seriously. But there's a lot of people who, like, if they don't 4K, they don't have fun and they don't enjoy this game and they feel like shitting on people is what is fun uh so yeah yeah i was Just recently the... talking about that the game's balance would be more of like getting a 2k yeah you yeah win every game like how how is a game that you win every time balance yeah i think if there's any game where anybody ever wins every single game that they play even if they're the absolute best player in the entire world that would indicate that there's a problem yeah kind of why i not haven't played this game that much anymore like I win the majority of my games. Like, it's not even a flex, it's just a fact. And it, I don't find it fun winning every single game I play because people are used so lesser skilled than me and they're not like a calm team or anything. Yeah. Yeah. No, I feel what you're saying. But it's still really hard to balance. Yeah. To, yeah. to make it like. Because, like, if we compare, like, my skill, Trickster skill as killer, and then compare that to someone who just hit a red rank, it's significant. Just at me next time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Damn. But no, I I agree. It's like, but it's like the same thing with survivors too. Like survivors always like, oh, I should have escaped. You know, I should escape this round. But like, uh, I don't know. You gotta kind I, of expect. I kind of agree with Posh with what what you're doing with this. That's kind of like how I am now. I don't focus on escaping anymore. If I spin the killer one time or make them like whiff and look dumb, I'm like, okay, well, I would just won yeah. this game. Oh, yeah, like half, the time, half the time I'm just head oning people and if I like head on them twice I'm like okay I won dude you can kill me you can moy me I don't yeah. care I won <laughs> I, will, I will literally throw the game to go down to basement and try to lock her CJ oh my one God. of my swift teammates bro <laughs> if we all die in basement I start laughing oh, yeah. I I'm like oh <laughs> for, for dumb text for spins I throw reverse text dude Yep. my win condition like, I, is to I... flip flop the killer once a month oh my <laughs> god I quit caring about winning. Yo, flip flop power struggle. Let's go, dude. Yes, flip flop value. It only took us like how many years? It's finally gonna get uh, some value. Finally usable now. It's also super fun when you do challenges for yourself. For example, get as many headless stunts in a row. Kobe or die challenge. Um, I once tried to Kobe twelve games in a row with max luck offerings. I failed all of them. And I was mauling. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, like, it's, it's challenges that are, like, just genuinely fun with friends is, you, you know, fun, obviously. Yeah. I, I guess that... I, I really gotta, like, I know the cons consensus is that, like, Death Slinger and Pyramid Head are just mm. not very fun to play against. Sure. But, like, <laughs> I really do like Blight. I like playing against Blight. I like, from what I played against the Twins on PTV, I like them. I mean, they're not necessarily the strongest killers in the game, but they're really, like, unique and fun to go against. And it's just, 
I really hope that they continue in that direction where they're not necessarily the strongest, but they're really like they have interesting stories. I they offer something new. I remember like back in the days, I don't remember which dev said it, but I remember it was probably in the live stream. They said, we don't want to make every killer top tier. We want to make some killers mid tier and some killers will just not be better than others. That's just how it will be. And I was going to bring that up too. Yeah. And that some kills will just be more fun than others, while some others will not be fun at all. They said that on a live stream and then turned around, reworked Freddy, and made him super boring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some killers will just simply not be fun to go against. Quick, guys, that's our Wh cue. Which makes sense. Which makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Like, I get it. Like, not every killer will be a hit. Not all of them will be perfect. But I do think there should be some things to avoid. Like, if there's something that's clearly causing everybody to just be super annoyed, and it's like, all right, I don't even want to play against this killer anymore. It's so, like, the biggest example would be Old Legion, then Ugh. it shouldn't exist. Like, games are played to be fun. Now, don't get me wrong. Every game can produce frustrating moments, no matter, like, you know, what game it is that you're playing. However... I think if there is something that is clearly a problem for the majority of the player base, or even just half, because that's still a pretty large number in itself, yeah. then there's a clear issue there. Like, if half the community is like, alright, this is clearly too weak, or okay, this is clearly too strong, or this is too boring, then there's an issue there. Yep. The, w the one thing that happened is when they had that spirit bug, like, even though spirit was still good, it was still fun to play against even because like I, f I still feel like i had a chance Same. to like make a play so like uh, the fact that they reverted that was kind of upsetting because spear was still strong on like short loops and was still really like powerful but just the fact that we had some information that made us feel like we were able to do something i felt that like that would have been a good change but they took it away yeah it would have actually added on quite a bit to us spirit actually uh SKT, I think mm -hmm. uh, you might actually have uh, a better view on Spirit considering the fact that I used to play a lot of Spirit, but I kind of dropped her after Demogorgon came out. So, the change, well, the quote-unquote bug, got rid of those stupid Spirits that would just stand still at pallets to quote-unquote mind game. And I think that was great, you know? But, like, anyone who uses her power normally, the way it's meant to be used, like, it, it didn't matter. It just it just nerfed the people that would just stand still. Yeah, it made it actually fun. Like when I when it happened, I like usually when I play a spirit, I just like start molding. Mm -hmm. I can't like leave. <laughs> so with the fact that that happened, and it was like kind of enjoyable. Yeah, it was it was literally that um, separating the mediocre from the good ones. Like that's kind of what it should have yeah like, i agree like with other kind of like with every other killer yeah. like yep. like a nurse it's like oh she she adjusted her blink whatever like oh that there's that skill cap like she's rewarded for doing that but yeah i guess let's just uh take it away even though everyone was for it yeah like i don't think i saw anybody say that it was bad except for like you know reddit and the forums but I mean, you probably shouldn't base your opinions off the Reddit or the forums, though. Yeah. Now, one thing that's actually interesting, uh, Posh, I want to go back on this one, but you said you actually have fun going into play, which I, I actually find to be interesting because, I mean, granted, fun is very subjective, but mm -hmm. I honestly feel like uh, Blight actually has the power to shut down a lot of really good tiles, and uh, I feel like sometimes whenever I play them, maybe it could just be the people that I'm against, perhaps, but I feel like there's just a way where... Uh, he becomes so good at certain tiles that you pretty much just shut them down enti entirely without much uh, competition. Like, you know, the shack, lo well, maybe not long walls, but, you know, like uh, short wall jungle gyms. I mean, I even found a way to actually shut down cow tree if you, like, uh, navigate the right way. To be honest, I think it's, like, I, I, I agree with Bosch. I find him very fun. Me too. Um, I think it's more, he's more shut down when you're running from a loop to another one. I think that's, like, probably, like, where he really shines. And, yeah, there's a skill cap to, like, being able to shut down, like, a jungle gym or whatever. Uh -huh. And I've seen some Blights do that, but not everyone can do it. 
I think yeah. I think that's probably um, where he really does shine, though. So perhaps he feels better to go against because even if he can do that, you know that they invested a lot of time to get that good. Yeah, even I then, feel but like I can still outplay him too. Like I can. Uh -huh. Go ahead. I feel like there's sort of a um, like a not. not Obviously, he's not on the same level of nurse, but the reason that like nurse is allowed to exist is because you can't just like pick her up and be that good. Like there's like a learning curve that you have to go through to get that good, and it's maybe just because I haven't gone up against a lot of good blights, but like really a lot of them haven't really hit the point where they're like really good with the killer yet, and it's really fun to go against them. Um, and yeah, I. Like I agree, like it's getting from one tile to another. Like he really shines when you're out in the open. Um, but like at loops, I don't think enough people have like figured out how to like take advantage of his power at like jungle gyms and stuff like that. Um, so yeah. I've gone against um Jesse's blight, BK alone. And he's number one ranked blight on the leaderboards currently and it's he's so overwhelming <laughs> when he plays him. He he just knows everything he can do with him. And I I think that's fine because he yeah. has put so many hours into that character. I agree. I, I think don't get mad like... at White's plower, power, I get mad at their playstyle. Yeah. You're an undying tinkerer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is the one thing that uh comes with Blade is that they typically have like one build that they run. Yeah. And, but that's pretty boring. But like as a killer, I think that he has a very unique power that's really fun, uh, at least for me, to go against. Fair enough. I, w I was actually, you know, I was surprised to hear about it, but I think I'm fine with what I've heard there. <laughs> I think. I don't, I don't know what it is. I, I, it's just funny. It's funny, like, running them around a rock. <laughs> like... I've done that so many times where like they just keep like bouncing off things to try to get me and I'm just looping this one little rock on Yamaoka. <laughs> or maybe another That's thing fun. is that uh, as they try to rush towards you, you just kind of like uh, block them while they're not in their lethal rush and you just, just push just them run to the side. Just run out the blight for it. Or when they're trying to blight away and they bump into the same tree three times. <laughs> That's the best part. Oh, they get I'd stuck in the door and shack. You just, you just stand there <laughs> watching them and you're like, <laughs> hello. There is one thing that triggers me about Blight, at least when I'm playing against him, it is whenever I try and stun him, there was like, oh, I broke the pallet. Huh. Plus 1k points. Cool, I guess I didn't stun him. Like, you mm -hmm. keep getting this stun icon that gives you the points, but they never give like a like, show that it gets stunned. I feel like every killer that has the, uh, that has the ability break to break pallets with their, uh, yeah. with their power has that bug. Yeah, like Billy, Bubba. Like I don't, I don't even try and pile some bubbas because I always get hit through it. Like, like for me, I don't even care about trying to pile some bubbas. I use pre-drop the panel and run away because I, I can never get the stun anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to be like a yeah, theme right now. Well, I guess we're all kind of done with that one, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right. It was a good talk. It was. So, is there anything else that anybody else want to cover at all? Because we did go over our uh, intended topics for tonight, but I just wanted to double check. I'm pretty good. I don't know about anybody else. Yeah, I'm pretty good too. I think I said all I wanted mm -hmm. to say on the topics for tonight. Kind of same here. Well. It's been fun, so uh, thank you so much, guys, for uh, showing up tonight. And for anybody who's uh, in the chat, I appreciate you all stopping by as well. We'll be having our next podcast on Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern, or otherwise 8 p.m. GMT. And with that being said, I'm going to be ending off the podcast here. So thank you so much for everybody. And if you liked any of the uh, content creators here who are with us tonight, you want to check them out, Feel free to type in exclamation mark podcast. Doing so will give you a link to our it will give you a link to our uh, document, which will give you links to their Twitter, their U well, if they have a YouTube, uh, their YouTube and their Twitch. But yeah, have a great night, everybody. Have a good night.
Hey. Alright, see y'all later.